Welcome to the Alex Jones Show on this Monday, July 18th, 2016. Today is the day that the RNC officially begins. Of course, we've had a lot of delegates, officials, reporters for the, uh, I guess, about the middle of last week. And we have uh, begun over the weekend before the uh, convention actually began. We were running the banners uh, behind the plane, Hillary for Prison. Uh, you can see those reports on Infowars.com. Uh, you can see uh, our, our news director, Rob Dew, riding in one of the planes. You can also see what it looks like from the ground. They enacted a no-fly zone, but we have other ways to get the message out. Uh, there's, uh, If you're watching the uh, live video feed there, there's the banner that we had uh, flying over the weekend. Of course, Alex Jones is there, along with many of our InfoWars reporters. I'm here in the studio, but they're going to be joining us throughout the show with reports of what's happening there, as well as today is the day of the large pro-Trump rally that we've been uh, talking about for some time. Uh, this is the one that's the America First Unity Rally that was put together by Roger Stone, Alex Jones. Uh, many people are going to be there at that rally today. We're going to be having a live feed from that rally as well as a feed of the speeches uh, from Alex Jones and others. Of course, we also had uh, Alex encountering the turd blossom uh, multiple times, uh, both uh, before he took off on the flight and after he saw Karl Rove at the airport. And so we have a, another update of the encounter between the two of them. You know, of course, Turd Blossom was uh, not my name uh, for Karl Rove, but the name that was given to him by the man who perhaps knows him the best, George W. Bush. And uh, we'll tell you what that name means if you haven't figured it out yet. But um, we're going to have a clip of that that we'll play for you. There's also uh, some updates as to what's going on in the Republican convention. It officially begins, as I point out today. And, you know, we look at the conventions that are going to be held this week and next week. For the most part, the, it's a party with a small P. Uh, that's essentially what our political conventions have become. They've become uh, essentially a free press conference for the two mainstream political parties. Although this year, it's going to be a bit different with all the Black Lives Matter threats, with the uh, shootings of police, with the threats of massive riots at both conventions. And so we're anxiously waiting to see what's going to happen there. We're going to look at what the head of the police union in Cleveland has said, both about Obama's comments, uh, never putting any responsibility on the cold-blooded murderers of the police, but always telling the police that they need to behave when they are, in fact, behaving the way the federal government wants them to behave, the way the federal government has trained them. And, of course, the federal government wants to take over control of the police. They want to... Equip them as if they are a military, paramilitary force. They want to militarize them, federalize them. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, what I think should happen, and that is that they should be privatized. We've mentioned that briefly before. I think the key is that we not allow the police to get farther and farther from our control. We need local control of the police. That's why we have the chief law enforcement officer in every jurisdiction is the sheriff, and he's elected. When we look at the police departments where a lot of this, these problems are happening, they are following the orders and they're only accountable to the city manager or to the mayor. In many cases where these uh, initial problems begin, they are focused on trying to get revenue for the city government. We need to have more control at the local level. We need to have people that are going to be peace officers. Remember that obsolete term? Remember when that used to be an authentic term and it didn't reek of sarcasm when you said it that's that's what we need to get back to we did have a point in time where the police responded to the people and actually it's not a fantasy as we pointed out it's actually in practice now in many different ways there's a lot of private policing already and so we can learn from that and we can expand on that and we need to make sure that the police are accountable that they are not being uh, turned into a uh, military force by the federal government. That is the key. And uh, we're going to take a look at what's going on with that as well as the convention, some RNC politics, how they're trying to move us in different directions. And we're also going to look at some pushback in France against open borders. People realize that this is about creating a civil war. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight on this Monday, July 18th, 2016, the day the RNC begins in Cleveland, Ohio. And, of course, we're going to have also Alex Jones and our reporters who are in Cleveland. They're going to be joining us live during the show reporting. We have a the America First Unity Rally that you've been hearing about. 
uh, that Roger Stone and Alex Jones have put together. That's going to be happening today. Uh, we're going to be joining that rally live as it happens. Uh, Alex Jones will be speaking there. Roger Stone, many others uh, will be at that event. Uh, Alex, on his way there, encountered Karl Rove, uh, the former guru of uh, George W. Bush. And, of course, um, uh, George W. Bush's name for him was Turd Blossom. You know, Turd Blossom is kind of a name for a, a phenomenon that you have often here in Texas with the cattle. Uh, when you have... Out of a pile of BS, you have a little flower come up. And that was a name given to Karl Rove by his, uh, uh, the guy that he helped to uh, get in, and keep in office, George W. Bush. I guess he realized that uh, Karl Rove is pure BS. And you know, he had back and forth with Karl Rove at the airport. Uh, Karl Rove uh, called the police on him in the Austin airport. And the police said, uh, that's not any problem. You haven't done anything. Uh, but just watch out for him on the plane because uh, the federal marshals are a, a different kind of uh, law enforcement breed. Uh, they, uh, if, if anybody accuses you of something, they're <laughs> going to take you right off of the plane. But uh, I guess, you know, he kept saying, well, I, I work for Fox. And I, I thought, you know, do they really pay Karl Rove to work uh, for Fox? Uh, does he really have any credibility after repeatedly saying that Donald Trump was never going to get above 30 percent? I mean, that was the mantra of Karl Rove. He was saying, don't worry about him. Uh, he's got his 30% of the people that are there, but you've got all these other candidates there, and as they drop out, uh, all that support is going to go to somebody else. And, you know, it's interesting because we've got Bill Crystal still not giving up on the never Trump idea, <laughs> even at this late date, even after they've gone through, lost at the Rules Committee last week. Uh, it isn't going to happen. They couldn't even get 28 out of 112 people to say that they wanted to try to change the rules on the floor. But these never Trump people uh, never learn. And they just keep going and going. So I want to play for you a little bit of a clip here. I haven't seen this myself. Uh, this is up on Infowars.com. Uh, Carl Rove triggered by Alex Jones again. Here's that clip. Okay, folks, Carl Rove is on the same flight with us to Cleveland. We're here in Dallas. I'm just going to go over and ask me a few questions. Let's do it. He's walking over to uh, Carl Rove. There he is talking. <laughs> nice to see you, sir. How you doing? Yeah. I, I, I'm having a conversation. I'm just answering your questions. No, sir. Are you going to back Trump or go off? Uh, you're filming this for your program, and I work, are you? I work for Fox. So or are you just so siphoning money off make sure Hillary wins? So, so I'm, I'm working for Fox. So thank you. You're working for Hillary? I'm working for Fox, so I'm not going to be appearing on the Alex Okay, and that's a little bit of the clip from yesterday. Let's roll the uh, new clip of what happened uh, once they got into Cleveland. Uh, that was when they had their first encounter. Here's the one when they got into Cleveland. Carl. <laughs> Carl, are you history's actor for real? Here he is right there. Yeah. Pastor, I never met anybody that controls history. Look right there. He said the people that were just like almost like Hillary. Wait, but you're so you're That's Carl Rove that controls history. He, he told the New York Times once he said <laughs> He's I the guy control who controls history. history, that's what he said he did. Matter. And we're gonna get your guns. We're gonna we're gonna open the we're gonna open the borders up. Yes, ma'am. Carl Carl, why are you running so much? Why'd you call the cops on the Hey Carl, why'd you call the cops on the for asking questions? Is he still American, Carl? Look at him right here. This, this is Carl. Same time. Oh, be nice. He totally ignores me. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier, he ran over the thing again. I got mad. I'm going to leave him alone. It is. We live in a strange town. I know. Can I take a picture with you? Yeah, yeah, come on. Come on. Ask him about I'm controlling just history. I'm Jimmy Garza's wife. Hey, Carl. Nice to see you. Good. Carl, tell us about controlling history. Or being a history actor. Thank you. Thank you. Did you get into that by the Screen Actors Guild? No, not at all. Not thank at all. you. You want us to protect you? Here, here. He'll take it. He'll take it. Oh, thank you. Very good. I want, can I have a picture with you, too? There you go, folks. Wait, this is a picture of me. There we go. There we go. What? How's Bandar Bush going? There we go. How's Bandar Bush doing? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Here, here it's uh, Alex, here. Sure, sure you can. There you go. Oh, Carl. That bag's history's actor right there. Inside that bag is the entire planet. That so nose there. The right there is history's actor. Thank you. Uh, there we go. He's wearing that. Carl, 
It's good hanging out with you. I really appreciate your time today. It's like, holy oh, fuck, me. How impressive. All the Jerry Hendricks you broadcast to. Very impressive. <laughs> But you're broadcasting to a crypt or a mausoleum or a internment home. How are they doing? Those guys are the Undertaker. We're from Chainsville originally. We're neighbors in Florida. Okay, so I'm giving them a little friend. Hey, Carl, why don't you call the council on this earlier? Really good. Let's see. He's up the first amendment, does he, Riley? Yeah. Nope. I heard dogs. I want to have a conversation. I want to get on the plane and get her. But did he go over golf security on? He did. Can you say I love Adrian from Hidalgo County? I love Adrian from Hidalgo County. Woo! I love this shirt, Mo on Lobby. That's right. <laughs> on Infowars. Right? Available at Infowarsstore.com. How are you doing? Yeah, you doing? Now again, you got to do the good and the bad. The Carl Rove and Alex Jones. You know. <laughs> right, right here. Hey. There we go. Turn Blossom. I am a friend. You know that. No, right? don't, don't touch me again. Do not touch me again. <laughs> oh, you understand? Sure, I'm in a Do not touch me again. Well, sure, I want you to. Do that, you do that, you're in trouble. Well, well here you go. Don't, don't, touch don't, touch don't touch me again. Sure, yeah. You're in trouble. Well, there you go. It's all on am Yeah. Don't, don't look at him. So don't speak to him. I think you're in trouble. Turn Blossom. He doesn't like the name. Turn Blossom. I was just asking him, that was kind of his button. He kind of triggered him with the social justice for him. <laughs> hey, TB, have a good one. Take care. There goes TB. Now, as I'm watching that clip, I'm thinking about the fact that uh, everybody is wringing their hands at the convention as it begins to start and saying, all these big Republican figures are boycotting the convention. Now, Karl Rove is going to be there. Isn't that nice? He's going to be there. I guess he's going to be commenting for Fox. I guess it's a paid gig, so he has to go. But uh, I look at this, and I look at the people that are coming over to pose with Karl Rove, like, um, you know, uh, he, he's some big celebrity or something. And I think, is it really a problem for viewership that people like Karl Rove aren't going to be speaking at the convention? Does anybody really care? I mean, it, it, people are saying, uh, well, you know, looking at the uh, guest list, the speaker list that uh, Donald Trump has put together here, and uh, it's not that impressive. And it's like, well, it could be worse. They could have people like uh, Karl Rove and Mitt Romney speaking, people that no one cares about. I don't see how it could possibly get worse than have those political apparatchiks out there. And when I look at Karl Rove, every time I look at him, especially when he turned around and said, you touch me again, you're in big trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just tapped him on the shoulder. When I look at Karl Rove, especially like that, the person that comes to mind or the, the, the picture that comes to mind, remember the movie Brazil? See if you guys can pull this up. Uh, there's a scene where uh, uh, the guy from Monty Python, actually, actually directed by um, the guy that did the, all, all the artwork for Monty Python, Terry Gilliam, uh, and the name is uh, escaping me right now, one of the key characters, and it uh, is a interrogator okay and this is a kind of a monty python take on 1984 and uh as he does the interrogation he puts on this big baby face mask okay smiling kind of smiling uh, contorted kind of a half smile baby face mask and that's what he wears as he's torturing people to uh, get information out of them it's called uh, the information there it is right there doesn't that look like carl rove especially when carl rove turned around and said you touch me again you're in big trouble <laughs> Okay, that's uh, that's Carl Rove right there, the baby-faced torturer. But uh, for the most part, what Carl Rove does is he tortures logic and he tortures the truth on Fox News. There he is right there. Our commentator, Carl Rove, getting ready to go to the Republican convention right there out of the airport. <laughs> okay, now the curtain is going up on the Trump show. This is what The Hill points out. They say, uh, Ohio does not prohibit the open carrying of firearms. The only exception made during the event will be within the convention hall itself. Weapons will be permitted inside a larger, quote-unquote, event zone. They call it an event zone. See, it's essentially what the BLM did, uh, not Black Lives Matter, but the other bad BLM, <laughs> the Bureau of Land Management, which is not at all about land management. They don't manage it. They try to take it over. Anyway, that BLM, the federal BLM, uh, put up that... Uh, free speech area. They had that little cordoned off area in the middle of the desert during the uh, Bundy Ranch standoff. Okay, that is what they kind of call an event zone because it's a little bit too obvious uh, when you call it a free speech zone. It's a little bit too obvious that you're shutting down people's free speech. So what they do is they have made it something of a tradition for all the political conventions, Democrat and Republican, the people who want to exercise their First Amendment rights aren't really permitted to do that. They are allowed to do it only under heavy constraint, far removed away from the convention center. So the people that they want to 
uh, voice their concerns to are not bothered by seeing those concerns. So they move them down the street, uh, put them in cages, confine them to an area. Now, what they were allowed to do, and had to go to court in order to do it in Cleveland, was to get a much larger area. But what we saw in political conventions in the past, the last uh, one that we had in 2012, what they would do is move them quite a ways away from the actual event itself, have a metal cage. You could go in there and you could carry your signs. They even had a little soapbox with a microphone, and you could all take turns to try to get up there and uh, say something uh, so far away that nobody could see you or hear you. But the fact that people are going to be able to carry firearms is something that really concerns uh, the police union chief. Now, he spoke out before, and I've got some news. I'm going to talk about that later, uh, about what the police chief said. He was very concerned about the fact that uh, people are going to be carrying guns. I've got to say... We've gone to rallies where people have been carrying guns because it was a protest of uh, Second Amendment rights being shut down. And we've gone to protests where people were not allowed to carry guns. I can tell you the only time that things got out of hand were when the protesters did not have firearms. And there's a reason for that. We'll talk about that when we come back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show on this Monday, July 18th, 2016. The day the Republican National Convention is beginning. And, of course, Alex Jones and our reporters from InfoWars are in Cleveland. Alex is going to be joining us in the next segment uh, to report of what he's seen so far. And, of course, what a lot of people in Cleveland have seen of us is the Hillary for Prison banner flying behind an airplane, and that's been going on for the last several days. You can get your Hillary for Prison t-shirt. That's what helped to pay for that banner that InfoWars is flying over Cleveland. Your Hillary for Prison t-shirt, same design you got on that banner. Uh, you can fly that around the crowds. You can pick that up at InfoWarsStore.com. Also, uh, as a thank you to those of you who have helped uh, to finance this operation by buying the products that we sell, getting us, paying for the expenses of us to uh, go to the convention, to fly that banner, to do the many things that we do. Uh, we offer sales from time to time. We have a major sale on one of our major products, as DNA Force. It's still 25% off at InfoWarsLife.com. That's not going to last very long. We're getting close to the end of this sale. We're getting close to the end of the supplies. And, of course, that is one of our premium products. I think it's perhaps our, our most expensive product because... It is loaded with bio-PQQ compound. There's 175 clinical studies that show what that compound can do for you. Uh, it's also a very expensive ingredient. There's a lot of different ingredients in DNA Force, but that particular ingredient that it has so much of that's so rare is also very expensive. It costs about $30,000 per batch, uh, just that one ingredient in DNA Force. So it's a premier product. We're offering it at 25% off. While supplies last, you can get that at InfoWarsLife.com. So get that. Get your Hillary for Prison t-shirt. Get into the uh, spirit of the conventions <laughs> that are going to be happening this week and next week. Of course, uh, the Republican National Convention is going to be followed up immediately by the Democrat National Convention. InfoWars will be there for that one as well. In Philadelphia, I will be there next week, uh, switching places with Alex. Now, as we're looking at, uh, as the Hill says, the uh, curtain goes up on the Trump show. They're talking about, and we have some people wringing their hands about uh, the fact that open carry is allowed in Cleveland. Quite frankly, I think that's a good thing. Uh, even though the uh, chief of police, uh, the chief of the police union, I should say, in uh, Cleveland is concerned about that. He's actually calling for the Ohio governor, John Kasich, to ban open carry in Cleveland for the duration of the Republican convention. And i got to say, when we talk about the rule of law, that means the rule of law for everybody. That means that uh, the governor doesn't just get to arbitrarily throw out the laws that are there. Neither do the police. Rule of law means that even the people in government, but especially the people in government, are under the law. And what we have seen from experience is that not only do you have a situation where when we look at what happened in Nice with the uh, truck driver going for a mile. As I was driving this last weekend with my wife, I said, you know, think about how long it takes you to drive a mile. We, we heard that uh, this truck driver was going very slowly when a motorcyclist tried to pull up beside him and tried to get into the, uh, into the cab to stop him from running over people at a slow speed. He swerved, he knocked the motorcycle over, uh, mo motorcyclist over and ran over him. And then he sped up, they said, to about 40 miles an hour. Now, even if, he was 
going 40 miles an hour the entire time, and he wasn't. Even if he was going 40 miles an hour, do you realize how long he was able to run people down? Just do this as a thought experiment. Just do it. Uh, kind of clock yourself and get a feel for how long it takes to drive a mile as you're driving down the streets. If he was going 60 miles an hour, it would take him a full minute to go a mile. He went a bit over a mile. If he was going 40 miles an hour, that'd be about a, a minute and a third, about a minute, 20 seconds that he's just mowing people down and nobody could do anything about it. Why? Because in France, they don't own firearms. So that's one of the advantages of an armed public. If he tried that in Texas, I can guarantee you that before he was able to mow people down for one or two minutes without any interference, there would be some people who would pull out their guns and shoot him, not waiting for the police to do something about it. So that's one advantage of it. But the other advantage that people don't realize, and this is truly what the Second Amendment is about. People accuse us of uh, saying that we're trying to overthrow the government or this is dangerous talk to say that the Second Amendment is there to control the government. But it is there in the same way that we had nuclear weapons during the Cold War as mutual assured defense, okay? Uh, mutual assured destruction if a war starts. So the presence of firearms has a restraining effect. This is something Robert Heinlein, remember the famous quote from the science fiction writer, he said, uh, an armed society is a polite society. You know where that really came from? That really came from uh, the Civil War. There was a British uh, colonel who came over, wrote a book, Three Months in the Southern States. When he was going through the South, he said, I've never seen a society where everybody was armed and where everybody was so polite. Yeah, it has a polite effect on people when you have a lot of protesters carrying firearms peacefully. Stay with us. Alex Jones is going to be calling in uh, and taking the next segment from Cleveland. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. This is David Knight in Austin. We're going to be going to Alex Jones in Cleveland. He and the InfoWars crew are there covering the Republican National Convention, which begins today. Of course, one of the things that's going to happen today, there's going to be an America First rally, the Unity Rally, that is put together by Roger Stone and Alex Jones. They're going to be um, having that later this afternoon. We're going to be having that as part of the show. We're going to cover uh, some of the uh, speeches from that rally. And uh, Alex Jones is going to be joining us in just a few minutes to talk about what they have seen. You've already uh, seen the uh, uh, the back and forth with uh, Carl Rove at the airport. Uh, joining us now is Alex Jones. Alex. Uh, that's right, David. Uh, I'm glad I got the connection through to you. We just, just, just got hooked up here right above the entrance of the RNC. We can show TV viewers uh, out there. Uh, and, of course, subscribe it for radio listeners. It's like an armed camp. And we uh, had to go through uh, a checkpoint with the Secret Service and others, uh, obviously going through the car for bombs. So all the vehicles coming in are doing that, uh, I guess, in case some of the jihadis or somebody uh, tries to ship a car bomb or truck bomb in here. So this is the new way of life uh, in America, and the uh, delegates and uh, others are all arriving. Last Friday, of course, the Republican leadership doubled back uh, on their promise uh, to not try to steal the nomination from Trump. They actually tried to do it again, uh, but but most of the delegates understood that they were pledged to the voters from their towns and cities, their precincts, so that did not happen. Uh, so it appears they're not going to try to block uh, Donald J. Trump from getting the Republican nomination to hopefully become the 45th president of the United States. Uh, now, again, I'm coming to you live from Cleveland and we have our reporters, Leanne McAdoo and Margaret Howe, uh, who are down at the uh, city park, uh, where in about an hour I'm going to be speaking. And the reason we're here is we had to have two different lawsuits uh, with Citizens for Trump, who had to sue the city of Cleveland for trying to block even allowing us to have a demonstration. And, of course, we even paid for the police and the security $30,000 in America and even after the, all that was paid, the city tried to double back and stop us. That, of course, is the Democrats that run the city. I have to tell you, though, uh, that if you don't exercise the freedom, you obviously lose it, just like the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Tenth Amendment, uh, you name it. But the police in this town and the general public, I have never, never, except maybe in Austin, Texas, run into more people on the street. Uh, I mean, cars are constantly stopping with listeners in on their uh, locals, going into restaurants, uh, about a third of the people in a restaurant I was in this morning uh, were listeners. We're going to upload that video. Uh, the, the police, a lot of them are listeners. Just a really awake group uh, of Americana-type patriots of every race, color, and creed. So that certainly shows, uh, you know, just kind of a radar ping of just the info war. Just this show uh, has massive numbers of people listening in Cleveland. 
from uh, you know, city workers to black cab drivers, uh, you name it, it is amazing. So very, very positive news. And, and, and Donald Trump is riding that wave, just we're all riding that wave of rising populism. You have to ask yourself, how is the arch criminal George Soros going to try to block that? Well, just like he funded the Arab Spring to overthrow moderate states uh, in places like Egypt uh, and um, Libya and install uh, Wahhabi as Saudi Arabian backed as a destabilization program, just like he brags he did that. He brags he helped launch the Syrian destabilization, just like he brags that he overthrew the elected government of Ukraine uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, with billions of dollars and billions of dollars of State Department money, uh, this guy is just a piece of work. And he's not the only actor uh, we've got who's involved in these activities, but this is all they can do. And then you've got Barack Obama and all these police funerals keep saying, hey, it's the police fault, basically. They need to reform. They need federalization. As if five dead cops and, 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 and ten injured cops in Dallas have anything to do with a questionable shooting uh, in somewhere like Minnesota or Baton Rouge. But even separately, what does going to the police department in Baton Rouge, sitting out there and killing three officers and injuring six others, uh, one of them still in critical condition, h how is that justice? And then there's the statistics of 258 black men killed a year by police. Uh, and let's say half of those are unjustified, probably a lot less. Uh, and, I, and I'm not saying any of that's okay. The media, though, takes this and makes this the biggest issue in the world, just like uh, Sheriff uh, Clark of... Uh, the county up in um, up in Milwaukee just devastated Lemon on CNN. That clips up on Infowars.com and said, "Listen, you got thousands of black people being killed a year, black men by other black men. In fact, it's over 500 a year in Chicago alone. 2,000 plus shot by other black people. 500 plus that die. I mean." This is Iraq war level dead for U.S. troops in an average year, uh, you know, just in Chicago. I mean, this is this is crazy, crazy, crazy level. And there's no discussion about it because it just shows it's violence in our cities. It's problems in our cities. It doesn't even matter if the New York Times comes out and goes, OK, a big study shows that on average officers do not shoot black people more than they shoot white people. Is there militarization of police? Is, is there some of these problems? Absolutely. <clears throat> but escalating and shooting random cops is going to only make it worse, make them more jumpy, and make them not go into these high crime areas, no matter what color people are in them. That's why crime, for the first time in 25 years, is starting to actually go back up in many areas, because the police will not go into areas where they're going to be shot in the back. And quite frankly, I don't blame them. Who the hell would want this job out there standing on a street corner all day, knowing there's a good chance some Black Lives Matter affiliated group is going to come here to Cleveland. I think there's a good chance and try to shoot some cops. Okay? So it's just completely and totally out of control. And I personally have had the enjoyment of being threatened, and, and so has Paul Watson and the rest of my crew, by groups that are allowed to operate on Twitter and Facebook and you name it, calling for violence. And when they get caught, calling for violence, they tell the, 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 the police, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize, and nothing's done. Okay, so you have black, new Black Panther groups and others on TV saying, let's go kill cops today and no one's getting in trouble. That's premeditated planning for murder. That's the organized of it. And it's because George Soros and the globalists are coming in and fomenting differences between people, exacerbating, exaggerating uh, problems and issues to make there be basically a giant uprising or revolution in this country against local government, which is actually the enemy of the globalists because it might stand actually against the globalization or federalization we see now happening. Same thing in Europe, same thing is being done uh, in France. The same situation uh, is unfolding in a big, big way, but they're using Muslims in this case as the destabilization force and then using the Islamic attacks that are happening all over Europe uh, and, and the rapes and the rest of it as a way to then ban people's free speech that criticize it. So again, I'm here on the ground in Cleveland uh, coming up at about, oh, I guess that'll be about uh, 12.30 Central Time, 1.30, but these things usually go late, 1.30 Eastern time, I'll be speaking uh, at this uh, rally, despite the threats and all the rest of it, because if we give in to these threats and give up our First Amendment, we're going to give it all up. The, the BLM, the, the, the MoveOn.org, the George Soros of the world, they've said they want to silence InfoWars. They say they want to silence DrudgeReport.com. They say they want to silence uh, outlets and, 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 and media organizations that are Americana, pro-Second Amendment, pro-First Amendment, uh, pro-veteran, uh, just pro, low taxes, just everything that made this country great. That's all we're trying to do is get the, 
the foot of the globalist, the boot of the globalist off of our necks. And we understand we've been conquered by multinational corporations. We understand it's a new form of colonialism. And so all they're doing is hyping this whole thing up to create basically a civil war. And, and I've been using that term for years, saying that Soros is planned. Now that's in mainstream U.S. news calling this a civil war. That is exactly what is beginning uh, to unfold in this country. And we can't let them get away with this. And I'll tell you, here is the absolutely fabulous news that folks should be made aware of. All the polls, all the numbers, all the metrics show this indiscriminate shooting of people, this indiscriminate killing of innocent police officers, uh, this absolutely, you know, demonizing returning veterans, gun owners, Christians, conservatives, and these FBI uh, reports written up by the Democratic Party and the Southern Poverty Law Center. This is only beginning to backfire on them, and the poll numbers show Donald Trump is rising. So people ask, why are they still activating these groups? Why won't Obama decry these groups? Why is he legitimizing it every time cops get killed, saying, well, you need to reform the cops? And Hillary says, hey, white people need to listen up. They're doing that to push it even bigger because they want to make it so big, so out of control, so bad, that even though it wakes a lot of people up, it breaks local government's will, it breaks the military's will, it breaks Congress's will, the patriots that are there, and we just capitulate because there's burning cities and war in the streets and hundreds of being killed a day. It could easily come to that, and that's what the French government's saying. That's what the conservatives in government are saying. They're saying Hollande and others are trying to push a civil war. They're trying to poke and push and push and push until there's an uprising and they're arresting people in France, Sweden, and Germany that just criticize open borders. That is outrageous. These are authoritarians. They're making their move. They think we're stupid, but we're not being caught flat-footed. We know their exact plan. We know their disinformation operation. And I'm here to tell them, you've really screwed the pooch because now you have taking the police, the military, local government, and, and, and people in the federal government who are patriots, and made them face just how diabolical you are, that this is a foreign multinational takeover, and you're not going to be able to put the genie back in the bottle. This is the beginning of the end for the globalist. And as we look out for TV viewers, give folks a shot, uh, as I cover some headlines here, there is the RNC uh, entrance. Uh, we are right across the street uh, from the, uh, what's the name of this place, dude? Quicken the Quicken Loans thing. I, I'm, I'm teleprompter free. I can't remember some of the stuff. Let's go over some of the headlines at Infowars.com. Crowds boo French Prime Minister. He, he's, he's even worse than the president. At Nice Memorial, demand his resignation. He has come out and said, fascism and nationalists are our problem, and those that criticize Islam. They are testing to be basically dimmies. That's what they call it in the Islamic system, like Bracken was talking about last week here on the show. They're testing to show you can rape us and we'll cover it up. You can kill us and we'll cover it up. It's why that top German minister got raped herself. 50-something-year-old woman, but attractive by five Muslims, and she said, I covered it up because I'm politically correct and I'm proud of it. And she got caught by the police covering it up in Germany. She said, no, German men, blonde men raped me. I mean, this is crazy. So so that's what this is about because they want to show we're here to be captured. We want your Saudi Arabian money. Give it to us. And then they just retire to Switzerland or Luxembourg or somewhere else. They're there saying, see, we're good minions. We let you run over us with trucks. We let you bomb us and shoot us. We let you rape our ministers. You are God. That's what this is about. Crowd booze, French PM at Nice Memorial. Demand his resignation. I mean, I kept wondering how Hollande and, 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 and this other idiot uh, could actually go to these funerals when they're the ones that opened the borders up and brought these folks in. It is absolutely, completely over the top. Now, again, that's what the program of putting radicals in these countries is about, is to make sure this destabilization uh, accelerates. This is the deal Saudi Arabia gets for everything else it's been involved in. Meanwhile, we have the Baton Rouge killer shared photo on Twitter of cop being shot before he came and did it. And this is what we've always pointed out, is that We've got folks calling for killing people, and then nothing's being done. Well, then that's really the fault of local grand juries and others, because I'm all for free speech 110%. But if I got up here on air with an audience, or I went to a Facebook channel, and I said, we ought to go kill cops, then, I mean, I'm calling for organized crime. And if people call for killing me, 
okay, or 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 who, whatever your free speech uh, venue is, if people call for violence against you because you have a particular political view, that's the final phase of a takeover. So again, we're not giving into this intimidation. We're standing up against it. But if local grand juries don't start indicting all these people that are calling for this, it's not going to put a damper on more idiots who think they're really fighting some great jihad or think they're really fighting against the man to go out and kill more cops. And this is going to bring a civil emergency in. This is going to bring what they call basically martial law in. It'll be called a civil emergency. They've done that now in Europe. So I'm basically ranting about this because we saw, and I shot a video breaking this down, that the world has never been closer to world war. That's what mainline analysts are saying. We've got coups and counter coups in Turkey. Erdogan probably staging it against himself because his own plane was targeted and they even blow it up and people thought it was staged as, as an excuse for a crackdown. I mean, I guess Emperor Palpatine did it in episode three of Star Wars. I guess it can happen in real life. But no, I mean, actually, the, the Taiwan president got caught doing a fake coup on himself once as well. So we're, we're not sure this is fake yet. Uh, we've got the world economic system teetering on the verge of collapse. All these derivatives, bigger than 2007, 2008 coming due. We've got governments flooding uh, their sovereign nations with unskilled, diseased populations. What is going on? What is the larger goal? We've never seen bigger destabilization programs in the West. The only countries I know of in the West that aren't part of a destabilization program are Japan and Australia. They actually have policies in place that they're not allowing them to be destabilized. I mean, there's some things going on in Australia, but it's only Australia and it's only Japan. And, and of course, New Zealand to a certain extent. And, and notice more and more of the globalists have been moving to New Zealand and to Australia. We told you about that years ago. Now it's mainstream news. They're leaving Europe. They're leaving Israel. They're leaving the United States. They're even leaving London, saying it's not going to be safe in the future, way before all of this happened, way before all of this began to unfold. So David Knight is going to be co-hosting throughout the four hours today. Uh, and we got Paul Watson coming up in the coming days. I'm going to be hosting most of the shows throughout the week. Uh, but David is going to be there with me. Uh, obviously to bring in breaking news, bring in breaking analysis. Leanne McAdoo got a very powerful interview with former political prisoner uh, Dinesh D'Souza, whose documentary 2016, America 2016, was the second highest seen uh, documentary in world history. He was then shut up and put in prison for nine months, is a political prisoner. Uh, he now has a film out that I haven't seen, but people say is like five times more hardcore. See, they radicalized him. Former Reagan speechwriter, he's headed up federal departments, folks, no criminal record, and he like gave some campaign contributions, and, and, and they put him in jail. Uh, now he's made this hardcore film. I couldn't go to the to the uh, premiere last night because I got in too late, but Leanne was there. She's got the interview. We've got kind of a bottleneck with only one editor here who's doing a great job to upload all these big uh, interviews we've got, all the breaking news and analysis. Now, speaking of Carl Rove, I almost felt silly making a big deal out of it, but I'm sitting there with my crew. And they're like, hey, they're, you know, there he is in Austin, flying out, could go confront him. I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to leave him alone. And then, because he's, he's, he's old news, he's defeated. We're going to skip his network break. And, and then I get on the plane, he's there, snickering and giggling and doing everything. So we get off at Dallas to change planes and come to Cleveland. Sure enough, he's there. And so I go over to him and I politely ask him some questions. And people have seen that video. It's gone viral. It's, it's not really that big a deal. He just says, I'm not talking to you and gets mad. And I bring up the fact that, you know, he basically vacations with the Clintons reportedly and the Bushes love him and that he takes the money that Republicans would use to win. And, you know, it, and, and it goes nowhere. As Donald Trump said, you might as well throw it in the trash to, to, to quote Trump in his tweets. This time he hadn't been successful going and getting all the Republican money. And then it just goes into some type of weird black hole. I mean, that's what people said, that it just isn't, isn't effectively used. But this is a guy who's known for just all sorts of really nasty stuff. And so he calls the police on me. The security comes. They say, no, if you ask him questions, that's fine. Just don't talk to him on the plane. So I go, okay, fine. And so and, and this is just emblematic of this country and how bad the Republicans are or the old line ones. We don't just have the Democrats on one side. We have the Republicans uh, to deal with as well, always trying to take things over. But they've been defeated uh, trying to block Trump so far. They've been defeated trying to gobble up and divert all the money into their super PACs. They've been defeated on many fronts. Karl Rove helped push the assault weapons ban again. I mean, I personally am sick of him. But then, but then last night, we get off the plane. He's coming off the concourse. And I say, tell me about how you're his history's actor. He told the New York Times and Washington Post, I control the future. No, the truth doesn't matter. We'll tell you whatever we want. You'll report it. The public will believe it. A very arrogant person. 
So I want to know from the guy that says my reality doesn't count and that he's the only uh, empowered person in the world, that I don't count. And so I went and I talked to him very politely, he ignored me, and then I tapped him on the shoulder very nicely. I said, I'm a friend, Turd Blossom, because that's the George W. Bush's nickname for him, and he got real, real mad about that. And the point is, is that this, I confronted him nicely the way I'm going to give my speech today for those that sat there and thought that they're threats. And I'm not going to get into the threats because I really don't care. But the point is, I was thinking a month ago about not actually coming to Cleveland because I'm so busy with family stuff and doing other things. I was going to just send crew. But I'm tempted to even go to the DNC now because of threats. You know, I'm not going to sit here and give up my life and my free speech because a bunch of scum are trying to create a climate of fear in this country. And that's where they've miscalculated. People always think when I cover scary issues, they think that they think that I'm doing that to scare people. No, I'm getting doing that to warn people, to motivate them. Because from my perspective, if bad stuff's going on, I want to know about it. I want to be prepared for it. If my neighbor sees somebody breaking into my house and I'm in bed, I want them to call me. They're not fear-mongering. If they call and say, hey, somebody's in your garage, thank you. Thank, or if my house is on fire. Or if a flood's coming, hey, you, or, or if it's going to freeze, hey, you're going to turn your faucets on. That's what good neighbors do, okay? And so that's why we're here. But it shows from their cowardly perspective, these globalists, they think killing 50-something cops in the last year or so, that's what's happened. They're shooting them all over. Most of the time they cover it up when a guy screams out of Akbar in Philadelphia and shoots him in the head or yells that in you know, California. I mean, it's happening like every four or five days. Now you're seeing you know, five dead here, three dead here, two dead here. So they can't cover it up. Just like all the newspapers, New York Times, and everybody was saying, a madman with a truck kills people. They're still saying that. I was, I was looking at all these delegates and folks still reading newspapers on the flight, you know, all these old delegates that were big Carl Rove fans. Oh, yeah, I forgot to finish the Carl Rove story. So we get on, this is why I really confronted him, though. We get on the plane from Dallas to Cleveland after I just talked to him nicely, and he walks by and talks to some of these delegates, because I heard him talking to them. They said they were delegates in front of me. And he goes, he's drunk. We ought to report him. He's a troublemaker. I'm just sitting there. Having had a drink, I did a few minutes later, and uh, I mean, well, why not? Uh, you know, was already claiming I am. And I'm sitting there, and he, he goes, yeah, we ought to report him. He's a troublemaker. Actually trying to get these old folks that look like to say something. And they were getting up and going to the bathroom in the flat and looking at me, and the, the, you know, the woman and the man. I was just like, oh, my gosh. And so then Rove comes off, and I go to the baggage area and, and, and bring up those points about how he, you know, he, tell me how you control reality. Tell me how I don't count. Here's the truth. Carl Rove is a shadow of, of his former self. Carl Rove is done, in my view, being able, and, and, and the rest of the old neocons and rhino Republicans and all of you people, you're done. You're done. And the future is DrudgeReport.com. The future is InfoWars.com. The future is places like Breitbart.com and DailyCaller.com. And, and, and look, here's the deal. InfoWars isn't perfect. I know none of us are. I make mistakes all the time and not on purpose. Breitbart isn't perfect. You know, nobody's perfect. Uh, Drudge is pretty close because it's just all those great links, but so there's not a lot of mistakes he could make. Just, he's kind of just linking to things he thinks is interesting. But the point is, is that we don't want to destroy America. We're not out to get the country. We want prosperity. We want freedom. We want people to come together. We're not the divisive ones pushing race. We're not the ones you know pushing all this garbage. And clearly, George Soros and other arch criminals are the people that think they can manipulate us like a you know bull with a red cape and the matador. And uh, look, I admire bulls for their strength, but not for their intelligence. We're smarter than a bull. And quite frankly, um, I've had more black people uh, on the streets of, of Cleveland come up and say they're listeners and they're awake than I've even had probably white people. So that's the truth, is that so many African Americans in this country are sick and tired of the division. They know they're being played. They actually know what's going on. It's so many white people that just kind of get scared or actually then think all the black folks are out to get them or something when the globalists are simply using that to create fear on both sides so they can be the referee. We have to transcend this and realize what's happening and understand the media is giving us a distorted view in my research from the reality of what's really going on. So again, it is more important than ever. You can see what we've been able to do with InfoWars.com. You can see what we've been able to build as a media organization that reaches tens of millions of people a week conservatively. I mean, gosh, it's like 10 million a week just on our own YouTube channel now. It is getting crazy. Uh, and then we've got all the other channels. I mean, I'm not, when I see 28 million a week worldwide, that is a very conservative number. And it just shows that I'm not that good at what I do. It shows the rising tide 
of liberty is there, and that's why the power structure is panicking, why they're trying to act arrogant, why they're trying to act like they're invincible, because they are very close to a collapse horizon. They are very, 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 very close. And you know the fact that Hillary and, and Obama banned our flights, we just flew them the days before. And they're going to follow her around the campaign trail. The biggest exclusion zone ever in history for the entire event here and in Philadelphia at the DNC. People say, oh, well, see, you, you, you paid the money and you, you know, now she blocks you. It just made it bigger, she's censoring. It's in all over TV, all over radio. People are all, all over. I talked to folks flying in. Buckley said like half the folks on the plane were talking about it. When I got off the plane in Cleveland, I had like six different people run up to me as I'm walking through who were already just in the airport saying, we already saw you confront Karl Rove. That wasn't even that big a deal. I'm saying we're the new media. You're the new media. Start your own YouTube channel. Start your own news articles. Get involved. Get in the fight, folks. All we're doing is calling out the emperor has no clothes. And support the broadcast. DNA Force, 25% off. Our top nutraceutical, nerve growth factor, patents proven, top of the line, detox your cells, get in there to the mitochondria, the engines. I mean, I still look like hell. And I work and play hard, folks. But I look a hell of a lot better than I used to when it's taking DNA Force and it's taking things like the Good Halogen X2. InfoWarsLife.com. Or call toll free 888-253-3139, 888-253-3139. I'm coming to you from literally 300 yards, 300 yards from the entrance to the uh, big Republican, you know, uh, that's right. What's it called? Quicken Loans Arena. For some reason, I can't get that in my head. We always have stupid names of corporations now. And I like, you know, it's like Staples Center and the Walmart Center. But it's time to stay in their name, though. That's what they want. So I guess it, I guess it worked out right there. So whatever. Uh, we're going to be in there some. And I love old people, and they're great. And when they're patriots, they have such wisdom, and I love them. But I tell you, you see these delegates that were trying to steal stuff for the Republican leadership, and I'm telling you, they are angry, and they're on average about 85 years old. And... I'm telling you, this whole Republican establishment is emblematic of how it is falling, just like the Democrats are. And I ran a lot of old folks as well that are Trump supporters, and they're awesome, and they are, they're so much more animated uh, than the old, mean Republicans that you know think they're the sovereigns like George Will said. We don't care what your popular vote is. We're the sovereigns. That's an arrogant piece of garbage. We'll be back with David Knight, myself, and more. Stay with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot stress to you that when I get up here and I talk about this, the, the Chinese fleet and the U.S. fleet openly saying they may have a, a, a war any day. That's not the Cuban Missile Crisis. The, the, the Chinese president says they're at battle stations for war. Uh, we've got U.S. advisors fighting Russians in eastern Ukraine. The Russians are moving missiles in. Putin's warning the world. And Putin comes out last week and a month before that and says, do you understand that we're going towards war and that you're starting it? You need to have a debate about this. There's nothing in our news to speak of, or it's like the back of the paper. And so for me, beyond Black Lives Matter, beyond George Soros, who's again behind what's happening in Russia, we just really have to understand things are serious and the world is going into crisis. And this happened before World War I. It happened before World War II. And most political analysts and historians are saying that we're going into a very, very dangerous period. Now, I'm going to go... Jump in a car, get down over to the park where I'm going to give this speech in about 30 minutes. Uh, we've got coming up Leanne McAdoo and Margaret Howe. I'll be able to popping in with David Knight. But I'm going to hand the baton to you, David Knight. I want to thank you and the rest of the crew for the great work you're doing, my friend. I want to thank you for the courage you've got, uh, you know, with your wife and children, uh, you know, letting you. But you've got one of your sons working with us, Travis, one of our best camera people. So he's doing a great job as well. But it, it, it's got to be surreal to not just be alive right now, David, but to be in the middle of it, my friend, and uh, to see so many good things happening, but also so many bad things happening. David Knight. Absolutely, Alex. It, it, it truly is amazing as, as this stuff plays out. I'm looking forward to uh, what's going to happen uh, this afternoon. The um, And again, in just the, uh, I guess it's about a half hour. It's the bottom of the hour. You're going to be speaking at the America First uh, Unity Rally. Uh, I think that's going to be very important. It's important that we get to these places. And uh, Alex, as you know, when we went to the uh, uh, the Alamo, the open carry rally that we had, the Alamo, we had a thousand people carrying weapons and nobody had a problem with it. Now we're seeing a lot of people, uh, a lot of articles I've seen questioning the idea of whether or not there should be open carry in uh, anywhere in Cleveland. But didn't the governor, uh, I mean, I'm only going off this since I heard on the right local radio last night driving in. Didn't the governor do the right thing and say, no, I'm not revoking the open carry? Absolutely. He doesn't have the authority to do that. And the police union chief was wrong calling him to do that. 
But I think an important thing that, that comes out of all this back-and-forth conflict that has been created by Obama, I think it's very interesting when we look at this shooter, the fact that he was a black ex-Marine, and that two of his police victims, the first one was a black man, uh, just like the shooter was, uh, and the another one was an ex-Marine, just like the shooter. Okay, the black man that he, the black cop that he shot, had exactly. a four-month-old child, and the ex-Marine had four children. And you know what? What makes this different, Alex, is that Obama has tried to get people to focus not on what people have in common. Not what the shooter had in common with these people, one of them being black, one of them being an ex-Marine, but to focus on what is different between them. That's the way the Democrat Party, that's the way Obama... David, that's perfectly said. And you, I mean, I think you should do a whole report on that, about our shared humanity and, and how clearly Obama keeps trying to say we need to reform the police every time more cops get killed, implying this is your fault, that, that, that he himself and the media have hyped this up. He is literally one of the main authors of this than blaming... Uh, random police. Now, now to take the head of the police union here, he's done the right thing, saying Obama's basically behind this and is stoking the flames and is horrible. And I yeah. am for open carry, and I get the perspective of people that want to be open carry. And you know, we've got folks here. Obviously, I'm not going to get into it uh, uh, for protection as well. I just get their fear of not being able to then tell who's got a gun and who doesn't because, well, they're going to think, they're going to have to check good guys as well as bad guys now. They want to be able to just pick out the few that have guns and be able to do something in case it's a jihadi or a Black Lives Matter issue. But but then, I'm sorry, terrorist attacking can't be used to take our rights. They have terrorist attacking saying, give up your free speech. Well, they have terrorist attacking saying, give up your guns. So I'm sorry to the police union. I can see their point, but the Second Amendment trumps everything. And so that's what this country's all about. It's why 1776 happened. David, uh, they'll be carrying my feed live when I give the speech here in about 30 minutes. Thank you so much, my friend. I'm going to hand the baton to you. Folks, stay with us. History's happening. Spread the word about the local station you're listening to or the stream or video feed you're watching right now because you are the power of this broadcast. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight on this Monday, July 18th, 2016, the beginning of the Republican National Convention in Cleveland, Ohio. We just heard Alex Jones reporting live from Cleveland. We're going to be joining him at the bottom of the hour. He's going to be speaking at the America First Unity Rally there in Cleveland, uh, along with uh, many other speakers that are there. We're going to be carrying uh, going that live at uh, 1230 our time, so it's going to be uh, about 20 minutes from now. And uh, as we were talking in the last section uh, about the way this has worked out, about this uh, Black Lives Matter murder and the people that he killed and the fact that he was focusing on what was different when, in reality, he had a lot in common with the people that he killed. But I want to read to you, before we go to uh, Joe Biggs, he's ready to join us in uh, Cleveland, I want to read to you real quickly a couple of things that were on his Facebook page. So the last things that he put up just before he was killed. The slain Baton Rouge black police officer said, please don't let hate infect your heart. He said, I swear to God, I love this city, but I wonder if this city loves me. Now, that was the black cop that uh, died. His sister said, uh, it's coming to the point where no lives matter. She said her name is uh, Jocelyn Jackson. She said she understands the anger behind the movement of Black Lives Matter. But she said, God gives nobody the right to kill, to take another person's life. And you have to understand, even though... They're protesting, and this is an ambiguous shooting there in Baton Rouge. Uh, these officers, even though they were in the Baton Rouge Police Department, they were not directly involved in that. They had absolutely no involvement in that shooting. Just cold-blooded murder and a misdirection of blame, if there is blame to be had in that particular shooting. That's yet to be determined. She said, it's coming to the point, this is the sister of the uh, black police officer who was killed. She said, it's coming to the point where no lives matter, whether you're black or you're white or you're Hispanic or whatever. And that's what I was just saying to Alex Jones. What Obama has done, what Hillary has done, what the Democrat Party in general has done, they have achieved their power and continue to achieve their power by getting us to focus on what separates us, what is different about us. And as I pointed out, this killer, this cold-blooded killer, was black and he was an ex-Marine. Two of the three victims that he shot, one was black and another one was an ex-Marine. And they had families and they were innocent. They were not involved in that shooting. Now, at the same time, we have the police, I believe, overreacting. We've got the uh, head of the uh, police union has, was right when he said that Obama has blood on his hands because he is fomenting this kind of division that I just pointed out. But at the same time, he comes out and says, well, I think the government, the uh, governor ought to just 
set aside the open carry laws that we have here in Ohio. You know, the police don't have that authority. The governor doesn't have that authority. The rule of law means that the governor, as well as the police, are under the law. The law is king. The law is king. Lex Rex was what the founders of this country uh, talked about with that. I want to join uh, Joe Biggs. He had a comment he wanted to make about the uh, whether or not open carry should be banned in Cleveland. Joe, thanks for joining us. Joe Biggs here, Infowars.com, live from Cleveland, where the RNC has now taken place. Emotions are high. There's walls built within the city by people who think walls don't work, which is kind of the funny thing. <laughs> we also have a sheriff that's coming out talking about the fact that these cop killings in Baton Rouge, Dallas last week, that they should suspend the Second Amendment for the citizens of Ohio here in Cleveland during the RNC. I have a huge issue with that. Yeah. We have that right. There are bad people who have been busted. Soros-funded groups who are coming out here to cause trouble. You've got the new Black Panther Party that's come out here armed to the teeth. We have that right. We have that ability. We should be able to protect ourselves. And then you have people like Don Lemon coming out, talking about these killings, and then Sheriff David Clark saying, you know what? Black Lives Matter is Black Lives Matter. This is BS. It's a terroristic organization. We need to put a stop to that. And we already have different concerts lined up that are like Rage Against the Machine to help incite these anti-Trumpers into uh, going out in the streets, getting agitated and then possibly doing something. So tensions are high, emotions are running high. It's going to be interesting to see how this week folds out, David. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you know this because this broke just before we went to uh, air, but now we've had another police officer, the most senior police officer, Joe, in the uh, Freddie Gray case in Baltimore has been found not guilty of manslaughter. Uh, yep. it's, it's possible this is going to be another trigger for the Black Lives Matter people uh, and it's an excuse to uh, come after people as, as we've... Uh, Pointed out, we looked at uh, the Hill. They said, uh, they quoted a person who was there at the convention. He said, most people going to the convention are concerned that protesters are going to turn the city upside down, that we're going to have some kind of a split screen with Donald Trump speaking and Molotov cocktails being thrown on the other side of the split screen. So that's what everybody's uh, concerned about. There's massive provisions underway for uh, thousands of people to be able to be incorporated, uh, incor uh, incarcerated there by the uh, Cleveland police. So they're expecting a lot of unrest, and I don't think that this uh, verdict on the uh, Freddie Gray case that came down today, I don't think that's going to help anything. Any? Well, yeah, that's definitely going to help fuel these protesters who've been paid to come in here and start stuff. They're going to use that as a catalyst to go in and attack people. They've already been calling for attacks on white people, white police officers. They destroyed their narrative yesterday when one of the guys actually went out and shot and killed a black police officer and left that little baby that's never going to have a father again. This is all fueled by hate. This is all fueled by George Soros. And this is something that people need to wake up to and understand you're creating more division. You're not helping the situation out whatsoever. There's a lot of love in this country. And there's a lot of people that I see out here of all race, all color. It doesn't matter. People here want to have a loving environment. They want to stop the hate. And just because you support Donald Trump doesn't mean you're a racist, a sexist, a xenophobe, an Islamophobic. I could go on and on with all these stupid names that people call them. They're factless. They're, there's nothing based off of it. They're just mad that this guy rose up and is becoming something that has created a movement so big. It's a tidal wave of patriotism that's about to sweep this country. You know, Joe, as we're talking about this idea of... Uh the Second Amendment and whether or not it should be suspended because of political situation. I, I recall uh, many different uh, uh, protests that Infowars has covered. And as my sons uh, said to me, the only time they had not been attacked when they were covering a protest was when there were armed people as part of the protest. That was when it was peaceful. When uh, only one side had arms, it seems like things got out of control over and over again. But there's this article from McClatchy that came out today. And uh, actually, it's on Friday. It looked hopeful at first, but what they did was they tried to use even the Second Amendment to divide black versus white. Here's uh, the title. It says, for black gun owners, bearing arms is a civil rights issue. And I looked at it, and it's like, great. Yeah, that's right. Of course, it's not just a civil rights issue for black gun owners. It's a civil rights issue for all of us because the Second Amendment is a, a key part of our civil rights. But they go through and they talk about one particular guy who set up a Facebook page. He's uh, about a year and a half. He's got 11,000 members who are following his Facebook page, and uh, they go back to the tradition that began with Frederick Douglass uh, talking about the different uh, uh, boxes that uh, our, our power as uh, citizens, our rights as men lay in, the cartridge box, the, uh, uh, the uh, ballot box, and the um, jury box. 
But then they go on to say black gun owners say that they have battled racism from within pro-gun circles and at shooting ranges. And it's like, I have not seen that at all. OK, I've not seen that at all. I have seen a lot of uh, I agree with the second part of it. They say and from fellow African-Americans who don't always share their view of gun ownership as a civil rights imperative. And we see that as well as as white gun owners. We see that people uh, get angry with us. Other white people get angry with us because we have guns. I'm sure he sees that as a, a black man. But I don't see that kind of racism. Uh, maybe, maybe it's the, the particular uh, shooting uh, range where he goes to, but I don't see that as, as a group. I see people trying to come together, and the only way we're going to get our rights is if we come together and forget these divisions that the Democrat Party, that the mainstream media wants to impose upon us of black versus white. And they even try to do that as uh, black gun owners are starting to wake up to the fact that they need to have civil rights, that they had their civil rights taken away from them by the Jim Crow laws. Took away One of the key things they took away was the right of uh, blacks to own guns. I mean, I've got a lot of black buddies who I go to the range with and shoot with on all parts of the, in Florida, Kentucky, all over. I yeah. go to shooting events all across the country. I have never seen that before. Exactly. You know, I do, I do see the, the, the gun-toting African-American male who understands his rights and being looked down upon by the African-American who might not know his rights and not understand why you would want to carry that gun and why they would think that they're a target. But it's good to see these guys that go out and do that. It helps them engage in conversation. It helps these guys learn what their rights are and it helps empower them. Everyone should have that ability to go out and bear arms without any kind of discrimination whatsoever. You know, when we're in Ferguson, we open carry up and down on West Florissant Avenue and all these Black Lives Matter protests came up and said, well, if we did that, we'd be shot. And you know what? We said, you know what? We'll stand with you. Yeah. You come out here as long as you're, you've got your gun at the low ready, your fingers not on the trigger, and you're doing it the right way to express your, your freedoms for the Second Amendment, then, yeah, you can come out here and you can march with us, and I guarantee you nothing's going to happen. It's and just, that's the key, you know, Joe, because we already saw in that uh, situation in Dallas, you had that one individual, a black man who was carrying uh, openly, carrying a rifle, and the uh, Dallas Police Department put out a uh, all points bulletin saying uh, this is a shooter, and uh, he turned himself in. They said we've got video of you shooting people. They were actually lying about that to the public. They lied about it to him. Uh, it was a very dangerous situation that he was in. But the key is is that gun owners stand together, not black gun owners versus white gun owners versus the police. They all need to understand that. I have to say to the police, if you want to know where this is headed, look at what happened in Venezuela where they spent tens of millions of dollars, I think it's about $50 million, to set up gun confiscation centers about four years ago. They took away the guns, and now the Venezuelan police are being hunted down in the streets and killed for their weapons. That's the future if you take guns away from other citizens. You are safer with law-abiding citizens doing open carry in these, pro in these uh, protests, these civil rights uh, demonstrations or whatever in uh, Cleveland around the uh, convention than if you were the only ones there carrying a gun. I mean, being a gun rights activist is definitely not the easiest gig in the world. You know, Jakari right. Jackson and I go to these things. We get harassed. I've been harassed for open and caring. But you just have to remain calm, talk to these guys, because there's a lot of uninformed police officers. There's a lot of bad ones who push unjust things, and you have bad leadership that allow these officers to do that. Absolutely. Joe Biggs, Cleveland, and we're going to be back with our reporters. Alex Jones is going to be joining us at the bottom of the hour. Actually, we're going to be joining him with the America First Unity Rally in Cleveland, Ohio, part of the 2016. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight in Austin. We have our reporters and Alex Jones at the Republican Convention in Cleveland, Ohio. Alex Jones is about to speak at the America First Unity Rally in Cleveland. We're going to be joining that uh, once that begins. Uh, before we go to our other reporters in the area, I just want to remind you that you can still get your Hillary for Prison t-shirt, uh, the same design that uh, you've seen flying over Cleveland uh, that we paid for with your help, your support, paid for these banners that we flew over uh, Cleveland behind a plane. And we've got uh, the report. You can see that on Infowars.com. And uh, we're going to go to Alex. He's just started his speech. Let's go. Let's cut to Alex Jones speaking at the Unity First rally is rising worldwide as the globalists try to implement their world government. It is dead on arrival. If you think the awakening we've seen so far is big, this planet and the globalists have not seen anything yet. Uh, remember, one time, one time, two elections. 
Why is it hey, hey, pretty much nice girls out where you where couldn't fly? Way. Airplanes with banners. I'm trying there. to get through Tokyo. One day after we announce we're going to have all the banners of the, of the hey, DMC yeah, and the RNC the covered with airplanes flying. Yeah, as soon as that happened, as soon as that unfolded, they put an exclusion zone on, shutting all aircraft down. That is because they're afraid of free speech. And that's what they always try to do is come and disrupt people and take over their free speech. These are not liberals. These are anti-free speech, anti-freedom scum. That's what George Soros is trying to overthrow Ukraine and everywhere else, any country that tries to be free, these globalists come in and they cause a bunch of division, they stir up a bunch of racism, they get everybody fighting with each other. And you know what? It didn't work. It ain't All this garbage has brought America together. That's right. That's right. We're coming together and Americans see through this crap and people all over the world see through it and know what's happening. So I can tell you. I don't like it when you're cheering me coming up here. I want to salute all of you that are out here in defense of liberty. Yo, standing yo, against tyranny. Yo, I right. salute you. Right. The, answer, the answer to 1984 is 
all of it, example after example, where people are trying out foreign multinational anti-free market corporations that are funding gun control here domestically yep. and open borders. Right, These are the people conquering us. And once we force this into the consciousness, okay. it's over. I cannot keep hammering that enough. And you, here today, I keep going back to you because you are the solution. You are the answer. You are the resistance. You are the reason the globalists are in so much trouble. For some of you have your own radio shows, your own podcasts, your own websites, your own local radio shows, some of you national shows. That is incredible. You are part of history. You are part of 1776, not just for America, but worldwide, because the American idea is the answer to the globalist program of enslavement. Right. You are the answer. You are the cure to the worldwide tyranny that is the new world order. And I'm telling you, Donald Trump by being in the arena, Donald Trump by taking action, Donald Trump by doing what he's done and talking about how we are no longer declaring that we have surrendered to globalist trade, that Hillary is a foreign agent, that Hillary is a foreign agent of the communist Chinese, the Saudi Arabians and others. No news carried that because there's absolute truth and would destroy her. But it doesn't matter. We got the info out. You got the info out. Right. And everything else he's been okay. doing has simply been absolutely oh, wow. over the top amazing. It has been it has been so incredible. I want to bring a few other little folks up here. Anybody wants to pop in or say something? Who's Roger Stone getting there? Oh, he's late. Hey, they want me to keep going. That's all. I'll talk all day, anyone. I see some of them there. They're both a great hardcore libertarian. Come on over here. Get up here on stage. I want to have dinner with these guys. And listen, what's good is Tucker Carlson's been pretty hardcore over the years, pro gun and stuff, but he's getting more and more hardcore. And that's what's exciting is that we see the information we talk about that was seen as radical becoming mainline. We have to be ready to win. We have to be ready to take the system back and restore the republic. My friend, introduce yourself. I'm Buckley Carlson. Nice to see you today. Um, I just want to say, make America great again. You say anything else, brother? You're off. Your dad's awesome. Hey, let's bring the Daily Show guy up here. Just bring the agitator right here. Just... Hello. How you doing? What's your name? Back up. Sign up for the open. Ah, uh, no. The Democrats are never violent. Like the Black Lives Matter events and attacking the Trump people. I'm not a uh, Democrat either. I'm a I know, I know. But the Daily Show is not a Pentagon weapon program. I'm not, on the, I'm not on the Daily Show. I'm on MySpace. Okay, okay well, that's good. But listen, I mean, I, I mean, you seem like you're upset. I want you to have sex with my wife. Uh, so just trying to be shocking. No, not at all. I really, here's my hotel key. I want you to have sex with my wife. <laughs> Sir, we're, we're, I know you're trying to be shocking I'm right now. I'm super into Trump. I'm Trump all day, baby. Right, Trump, baby. All right. Now, now you have been up here at the front of the deal, kind of bumping in, folks. Why does my pee, pee come out yellow? But oh, now I know why folks want to matter. This is an agitator who doesn't want to actually even have speech. He wants to shut down our speech. No, that's not true. That's, that's not his true. job. No, you, you, you want you want me to have, you talk about sex, talk about pee pee. That's not fair. That's not fair. Okay. Well, we have children. That fuel can't melt steel. We we have the bombs in Tower Seven. Well, I've exposed all that. That well, I'm with you. All right. Well, I'm on your side. Well, you, you, well, you, well, you said something legitimate You're there. You're looking for an argument, and I want to know who put the bombs in Tower 7. Okay, he just he wants to edit this later. He came up and talked about his hotel room and sex and pee-pee. Don't tread on me. I got a song called Don't so Tread this on Me. All to be edited. All to be edited later. This is all disinformation. Don't tread on me. Completely. Fuck my wife. Don't tread on me. All right. Appreciate you, sir. Now, you've just rubbed him. I'm on your side. All right, good. Thank you. You have nothing to say. Go on down. Just, just vulgarity. All right, folks, this guy, see, I did that to illustrate. Hey, I recognize this guy from one of the dinosaur media. Are you a Tyrannosaurus Rex? A Brachiosaur? A Diplodocus? A Pterodactyl? A Pteranodon? God almighty, I haven't heard, I, I heard they were still around. What, is your domain very big? Sure, I'll come all the crowd. Come up here with me. I forget what I'm serious. What port are you? Hey, Rachel Maddow's here. Rachel Maddow? Well, it's actually Chris Hayes, but I, I think they're the same person. 
I think I think Rachel Maddow and Chris Hayes or, or, or whoever that person is is the greatest actor I've ever seen in my life. Anyways, I, I seriously don't remember where this guy's with, but I know he's from one of these uh, kind of dinosaur old folks' homes. Or, 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 I mean, what do you call mainstream media? They, like, put the dinosaurs out to pasture, and, and they're trying to get a race war going and a destabilization going, but it's not going too well. And you know what's great about this is? Their power is dwindling faster and faster and faster, and all they've got is their, you know, their so-called arrogance, but they know that the blood is already all run out of them. They're dead. They're reanimated political corpses posing as liberals, but they're not. And that's what's beautiful about this, is that this republic is rising, humanity is waking up, and can you imagine, all the dirty tricks they're going to try to keep Donald Trump out, but even if they're able to steal the election, it doesn't matter, because the public is waking up to their tricks, and at the state and local level, people are understanding that globalism is about making us poor, globalism is about controlling us, globalism is about us not being able to have our own destiny. And all over the United States, but also in other areas of the world, people are saying, why can't I have guns to protect myself? Why does government have guns, but I can't have guns? And as we openly exercise this right, their power is faster and faster and faster slipping away. All right, folks, I'm going to come back up here later and introduce uh, the great American Roger Stone, uh, who obviously has been fighting so hard for liberty in this country for so long. And then we're going to have so much more going on today, and I'll be hanging out with you folks as well. But great job defying the intimidators. Great job defying the people that wanted to intimidate folks. Great job coming out here despite all the threats and exercising your sacred First Amendment. We salute you. InfoWars salutes you. And you are part of history. You are the future. God bless you. Love you. Thank you. Woo! USA! 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 Okay, and that's been the uh, live feed of Alex Jones speaking at the America First Unity Rally. They're in Cleveland, Ohio, part of the RNC, I guess we'll call them festivities, uh, part of the party party. Now, as we look at what's going on behind the scenes, uh, we've had the never Trump people shut down, the free the delegates people shut down. That happened last week. They had the rules committee that was meeting. Uh, they didn't get anywhere on that, but we still have the diehards, uh, the never Trumps who never learn, people like Bill Kristol saying that, well, I don't think this is over yet. Well, I don't know what he thinks he's going to do at this point. But uh, anyway, we're going to be having, uh, we're going to go back to our reporters live in Cleveland in just a few minutes. I want to take a look at uh, some of the policies that are coming out of this, some of uh, what some of the Republicans are saying. We've got Senator Sessions, who I had hoped would be the vice presidential nominee for uh, Donald Trump rather than um, Governor Pence. Uh, Senator Sessions says uh, that he thinks that Trump should not get into the weed with details. In other words, not go into so much detail. Uh, keep it at a uh, low level, a fourth grade level to explain to the uh, dumbed down population what's going on. I mean, you do need to give people some details. And uh, But I, I think Senator Sessions knows that uh, most of the people don't really want to know the details. He tried to give the details to all of those in the Senate about the Trans-Pacific Transatlantic Partnership. He tried to explain to them that uh, what they were doing in subverting the constitutional process to ratify a trade treaty with the Trade Promotion Authority was wrong. He set up a presentation to the people in the Senate because most of them didn't care about going in and getting into the weeds, looking at the details of these trade agreements, continuing to say, oh, I, I think uh, free trade creates jobs and this is about free trade, so I'm for it. Well... Free trade, as they've presented it to us in the trade treaties, has not created jobs. And this is about far more than trade issues. Uh, these uh, trade partnerships that are coming through are sovereignty destroying. They take away freedoms on the Internet. They take away our sovereignty and put our entire economy under the control of a few people who are unaccountable to those of us in the United States. You know, when you look at what happened with Brexit and the European Union, had a situation in Brussels where you've got people who've never been, in many cases, to Britain, uh, didn't have any interest in going there, writing the laws for them, telling 
fishermen whose families have fished the seas there around Britain for generations, telling them uh, they were not going to be allowed to fish there anymore, not even giving them a place at the table to determine what the fishing limits were going to be. That's what the Trans-Pacific Transatlantic Partnerships will do to America. And the only candidate, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Green Party, the only candidate out of all of those parties that opposes these trade agreements is Donald Trump. And I'm concerned when I see him picking a vice president who has traditionally not opposed those processes. And that's what we have with uh, uh, with Governor Pence. And as the New American asked, is he a globalist neocon or is he a solid conservative? Uh, I think he leans towards being a globalist neocon. We'll see what happens. But it clearly was an olive branch uh, to the Republican establishment to put Pence in there. And we have, we detailed as it was being talked about in the middle of the week, we're getting heavy hints that he was going to be the selection. Uh, InfoWars put up a couple of articles. There was one by Paul Joseph Watson, another by Kurt Nemo, very specifically going through the record of uh, Pence and the concerns that we had with it. The fact that he has supported the United Nations, the Export-Import Bank, uh, all these other organizations that have undermined, undermined our sovereignty here in America. He supported the Patriot Act. He supported the NDAA the indefinite detention by the military without due process act, okay? Uh, he has supported the war in Iraq, the unconstitutional war in Iraq. He also uh, supported giving Obama the authorization to go to war with Libya, even though he relied on a United Nations resolution instead of a declaration of war from the Congress. So there's a lot of concerns that we have, even on the border issue, uh, what's going to happen with uh, Pence, uh, his position on that. Clearly, this is a Reagan type of decision that uh, Ronald Reagan made by putting George H.W. Bush in, a man who had opposed him on all the critical issues, who had opposed him on tax cuts, calling Reagan's tax cuts, which, quite frankly, I, I think Ronald Reagan was one of the best presidential candidates I've ever seen in my life. But when he became president, he really didn't do much of anything. You know, he said he was going to kill the Department of Education, which was still uh, this nurturing demon in the cradle when he took office. It was less than four years old, but instead he fed it. Uh, he brought it to life. One thing that he did do, though, was he did reduce the taxes. He brought the levels of the rates down and he reduced the number of brackets drastically. George H.W. Bush opposed that. He called it voodoo economics. And when he took over after Ronald Reagan, that was one of the first things that he did. You know, he Everybody knew that he was going to uh, undo what Reagan did with the economy. He said, read my lips, no new taxes. He immediately gave us the largest tax increase we had ever seen when he was called on it. Uh, he sarcastically said to the reporters as he was jogging and running off, read my hips. That's the kind of arrogance that we get from the GOP establishment. That's what we see from Jeb Bush and others who... Fortunately, will not be there at the convention. Nobody's going to miss them, I don't think. Uh, I think we're all pretty much uh, tired of the elitist, globalist establishment. And so the concerns that many of us have are that um, uh, Pence is a peace offering to the GOP establishment. But in the long run, it's going to be a dangerous thing both for Donald Trump and for the American Republic here. Now, Roger Stone said this weekend in an article they put up on Breitbart that he believes that Trump is going to name his prospective cabinet at the RNC. Hopefully he will, and hopefully it will help to uh, take some of the sting out of this bad choice for vice president. This is what uh, Roger Stone said. He said, I think Trump is going to name a prospective cabinet. And there is, of course, a way to do this in a way that is perfectly legal. Because technically, of course, to promise someone a federal job is a crime. So Trump could theoretically say, for CIA director, I would appoint General Mike Flynn or someone like him. For Secretary of State, I would appoint, who knows, you know, uh, somebody else, okay? Now, they questioned him on this when he was talking to Breitbart. They said, are you saying that you heard from within the campaign that this is in the works, that this is planned, that this is what's happening at the convention? And Roger Stone said, I think you could take that to the bank. So I think that's going to be one of the big takeaways this week at the RNC is to get an idea of who Donald Trump would appoint to his cabinet. And hopefully uh, that will be something that will be more than uh, just a peace offering to the GOP establishment. Hopefully we'll see something that puts some uh, foundation 
under what Donald Trump has said he would do. They are, I think, in one way, they are making a clever pivot on the immigration issue. Sometimes when Donald Trump dumbs this down to a fourth grade level so that everybody can understand him, uh, it creates some issues in the way that it's worded. Wright Spiebus has gone out talking about the ban, the temporary ban on immigration that uh, Donald Trump talked about. He said, I think we need to do a temporary ban on Muslim immigration. And everybody hit the ceiling. First of all, they took out the word temporary. They said, you're just going to blanket ban all Muslims from coming into the country. And uh, what Reince Priebus has said, it would be a temporary ban on immigration from countries that harbor or train terrorists until we get a better vetting system. In other words, he changes it from uh, being focused on a particular religious group to being focused on a geographical area. But of course, the real issue is that people in other countries do not have an innate right to come to America or to any other country. As Alex Jones has pointed out many times, we as Americans don't have an innate right to become citizens of Mexico or any other country. Virtually every country except ours, except for Western Europe, uh, the two areas that they're trying to uh, alter, deliberately alter the demographics, deliberately set up a civil war in. That's what's going on. And the people in France are waking up to this. But outside of the United States and Europe, every other place that you go, you have to be able to prove that you can provide for yourself and your family, the people that you bring with you. You have to prove that you have uh, assets that you're bringing in, that you have wealth, that you have income capability. And in most areas, you have to have their uh, agreement that you share their values. Like in Switzerland, for example, there was a case recently of an American who had taught at university in Switzerland for about 40 years. He was retiring. He wanted to become a Swiss citizen. And they said, no, you know what? We don't really think you share Swiss values. You have to get the permission uh, or actually a, a character recommendation from people who know you in the area and say that you agree with the Swiss form of government because they don't want it changed. They have a system that they like and they don't want it changed. So in every other country, it's not a given right that you have to become a citizen of that area. But of course, what we have here in the United States with these countries that they're talking about banning immigration from. We have a situation where we have gone there. We have fomented civil war, unrest. We have inflamed both sides in these conflicts. And then we go in there and we say, well, you know what? We don't think that uh, we're going to do foreign aid anymore. We're not even going to try to help you in that country. We're going to say the only thing we can do to help the poor people who are victims of our policy of arming both sides, the only thing we can do that is humanitarian is not to stop the war. Not to give them a safe area in that place, but to bring them into the United States. And by default, they get to come in here, and the onus is on us. And if we uh, say that we're not going to uh, bring them in, then we're racist, we're xenophobic. Look, people, regardless of what country they come from, regardless of their race or their religion or anything else, they need to be able to prove themselves to be the kinds of people that are not going to be a problem in this country. When we look at what happened in Nice, you've got a guy there... They didn't have any record of him in Tunisia being radicalized, said the Tunisian uh, government. Yet the French police knew multiple times that he had been caught committing crimes. They didn't deport him. They allowed him to stay. And you see the fruit of what happens with that. In these countries where people are coming in, we don't have any way of running a background check on them. They shouldn't be able to come in. It's just that simple. Unless we can verify who you are, unless you have financial assets, assets that you can support yourself and your family, there is no presumption that people should be allowed to uh, come into uh, the United States. So it, it is interesting that they take this new turn and they have explained it better to say this is not going to be a religious test. We're looking at particular countries that are harboring or training terrorists. But we have to get past this mindset that is being foisted upon us by the people who want to divide and reorganize the demographics and the system of law and the culture and everything else we have in this country. We have to get around the idea that it is the default is that people get to come here and uh, we ought to have a good reason not to allow them to come in here. That, that is turning that whole process upside down on its head. Now we can see at the same time that uh, Reince Priebus is trying to uh, turn this into a more understandable position for the mainstream media, one that does not rely on religion. We see that Paul Ryan, who is facing a challenge the beginning of August, a very severe challenge, he has dropped below 
50% in terms of people who support him in the primary that's coming up. He is now flooding his district with mailers talking about how he believes in border security. He believes in border security. What a joke, as Breitbart points out. He has funded every open borders initiative. They say every Obama open borders initiative. Look, Paul Ryan has been open borders way before Obama. And we need to not make this a partisan thing. We need to understand, and Paul Ryan is exhibit A, that both the Republican elite as well as Obama, it's not gonna go away with if Obama goes away. The, the Republican elite have supported open borders. Now he's saying he doesn't because he's in trouble. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight here in studio. You just heard in the uh, last segment we had Alex Jones speaking at the America First Unity Rally at uh, Cleveland, part of the RNC uh, coverage that we have there. Uh, he's now trending on Twitter, by the way. It's kind of interesting. Uh, I was just told that from uh, Mikhail, one of our writers, uh, noticed that Alex is uh, trending after the speech there at the America First Unity Rally. And again, if you have seen the banners that we were flying the end of last week, you know, they shut down, they made it a no-fly zone. We're going to fly Hillary for prison banners, just like the T-shirt design. And, of course, you can still get that at InfoWarsStore.com, the Hillary for prison T-shirt. We took that same design, and we put it on a uh, banner to be flown behind a plane, and we'd schedule it for the convention itself. Uh, they made it a no-fly zone, so we flew it last week and got a lot of coverage because uh, there were a lot of delegates that were going there early as well as uh, the press that were going there. Uh, so we still do it. We've got other tricks up our sleeve uh, for the conventions to get our message out as well. And we appreciate your support. Your support, buying Hillary for Prison t-shirts as well as the other products that we sell, that is what funds our operation. That's what allows us to uh, go to cover the RNC. We'll cover the DNC next week. And as an appreciation, uh, we've offered uh, DNA Force 25% off. That is our premier product, our most expensive product, because of the bio PQQ compound. It's $30,000 per batch to add this, but we go to that trouble because it is such an effective compound. There's 175 clinical studies. It's extremely hard to secure. And uh, in this form that we get it, it's uh, only really one supplier out of Japan that has it in a pure form. That's why it is so expensive. You can read those clinical studies. You can read reviews that people uh, have put on our site talking about what it has done for them. And uh, you can get 25% off of DNA Force. And it's not going to last much longer uh, before it sells out, before that uh, special comes down. So take advantage of that right now. That's a huge savings for DNA Force. 25% off our most expensive uh, product that we have at InfoWarsLife.com. We're going to be going back to the... Uh, Unity Rally here in just a few moments. We're going to have uh, Roger Stone is going to be speaking there. Before we do, I was just talking about uh, some of the problems and the hypocrisy within the Republican Party. Uh, the fact that we have Paul Ryan, who has been open borders forever, not just uh, with Obama, but even way before Obama, he's been pushing open borders. Now that he is uh, sinking in popularity before his primary coming up first week of August, He's now flooding his district with mailers talking about how he is going to be strong on border security. Right. Don't fall for that. Uh, people in that district and people across the country, we really should have a concerted effort uh, to try to get his opponent, uh, Paul Nalen, I think, um, uh, is, is his opponent. Uh, he is someone who is opposed to open borders, his opponent is. His opponent is also opposed to the trade treaties that Paul Ryan has run through. Paul Ryan was part of the process to throw out the constitutional uh, requirements for ratifying a treaty. That was the TPA. They're going to have these treaties that were negotiated and written in secret by corporate lawyers are going to be run through both houses of Congress. That's not a requirement for passing a treaty. It's supposed to be two-thirds of the Senate. They couldn't get that. So they went with a simple majority of the two houses. They shut down all amendments, all debates, all filibusters is going to be introduced without any obstruction whatsoever in the legislative process. They've completely shut down the Constitution and the legislative process. Anybody who supported TPA has supported a violation of the Constitution. It's just that simple. Even if you agree with free trade, can't you see how they are subverting and throwing out the Constitution? Meanwhile, we got the GOP uh, Senate pushing for a half a billion dollars for Obama's climate fund. 
Now, these are the problems that we're faced with, even within the GOP, especially within the GOP leadership. That's why Paul Ryan needs to go. Stay with us. We're going to be back with more live reports from Cleveland and the RNC. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight. We're going to be joining our reporters in Cleveland in this hour. Before we do, I want to give you some other news outside of the Republican convention. We have news that, uh, this is via the Drudge Report, 123,000 Venezuelans are crossing the border looking for food. See, I guess they're running out of dogs and cats to hunt down in the streets. That's the fruit of government-controlled economies. What Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton are selling us. What many in the Republican Party are selling us. It's not what Donald Trump is selling us at this time. Hopefully he will not try to sell that to us. But look, you have to understand, and I've pointed this out, Bernie Sanders, even though he opposed the uh, trade treaty, uh, that was the Trans-Pacific Trade Treaty uh, when he was running, but of course now he has uh, fallen in line behind Hillary Clinton and Goldman Sachs and the rest of them. Uh, he has basically betrayed all of those principles. But uh, at the same time, he was right on some issues like that and some of the civil liberties issues. He was also a thoroughly unreconstructed socialist, somebody who still had not realized what was going on in Central and South America. He had not learned anything in 30 to 40 years. He had gone down to Nicaragua. He had praised the Sandinistas and that revolution down there. And he still could not bring himself to see the fruit of government command control economies. The idea that they can give you things for free. No, they can't. Eventually what happens is you run out of other people's money, as Margaret Thatcher pointed out. And they have long since run out of other people's money in Venezuela. It happens in these poorer countries more quickly than it does in European countries because they don't start with as much wealth to, uh, to, to begin with. Now, what's happening there, reported by the AP, is that, uh, again, over 100,000 Venezuelans, I estimate about 123,000, some of whom drove through the night in caravans, crossed into Colombia over the weekend to hunt for food and for medicine that was in short supply at home. This is not anything that's new either. We reported about uh, three years ago, in 2013, it was Bloomberg bragging about the fact, uh, the Wall Street uh, Bloomberg bankers were bragging about the fact that Hugo Chavez's successor, his socialist successor, understood that the banks came first. The banks came before food, before water, before medicine for the people of Venezuela. And they said, it still remains a really good deal for us to invest in Venezuela, We've gotten about 700% return on investment because these guys put us first. So you have to understand that Wall Street and the people's governments of these socialist countries, the people's governments like uh, uh, Bernie Sanders and even Elizabeth Warren, they are not polar opposites of each other. They're quite comfortable working hand in glove with each other. They go also go on to point out that Venezuela's government closed all crossings a year ago in order to crack down, as they put it, on smuggling along the border with uh, Colombia. They said it complained that speculators were causing shortages by buying up subsidized food and gasoline in Venezuela, taking them to Colombia where they could be sold for far higher prices. Yeah, well, that hasn't been the case for quite some time. Because for quite some time, for at least three years, even before they closed the border, they had food, water, and medicine shortages. So it's simply a lie by the Venezuelan communists, as we see happening over and over again. Meanwhile, our government continues to lie to us. This is another story that's up on the Drudge Report about genetically modified food. This is what we've been telling you for a very long time. Americans are buying a gene-edited food that is not labeled GMO. You understand, of course, that when we talk about something being genetically modified, and I still think that there's a lot of people in the American public that don't understand the difference between selective breeding and transgenic modification where they go in and they actually edit the genes splicing in different completely different animals or splicing in plant genes and animals or animal genes into plants even mixing across uh, the plant and animal kingdoms creating these kind of frankenstein monsters but of course both the republicans and the democrats have given us the dark act which says that you're not going to be allowed to have labeling laws in your state, in your local area, so that you can know what's in your food. Of course they're deceiving you. And they even brag about it. Stay with us. We're going to be right back with more reports from Cleveland. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight here in Austin. Of course, our crew and Alex Jones are at the convention, at RNC, the RNC convention in Cleveland. 
Today, there has been the America First rally. It's going on right now, the Unity Rally. We heard Alex Jones speak earlier. Right now, we have Roger Stone speaking at the rally. We're going to pick up that audio live. Here's Roger Stone speaking at the Unity Rally in Cleveland. Real fundamental change to America. And in Mike Pence, we have a man who understands the role of the vice presidential candidate. It's a supporting role. It's a, it's a role to support the man at the top and his agenda. And the number one agenda, other than dealing with terrorism in this country, is to rebuild the prosperity and opportunity of the American people. Amen. Mike Pence is a job creator. Amen. Donald Trump is a job creator. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton think jobs are created by the federal government. And they will foster policies that have killed jobs in America. NAFTA, TPP, these phony globalist trade deals that have sucked the jobs and the spirit from the American people. It is my great honor to have been preceded today by my friend Alex Jones. And as I told CNN this morning, better Alex Jones than his cousin Van Jones. <laughs> Folks, I'm a giant fan of Infowars.com and I see, I see so many Hillary for Prison t-shirts out there. Uh, and I, I am just honored to be here with so many patriots. I want to, I want to say a special word about Tim Salati Sr and Kathleen Flaherty and the good folks at Citizens for Trump who had to go to federal court to knock down the gag rules to suspend our free speech rights. They didn't want us here today. And they still don't. And the Democratic machine, you can look across Cleveland, take a look at the factories. They're closed. They're out of business. This is the legacy of Democratic leadership in this country. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a few words about Hillary Clinton. And of course, this is the uh, unity rally. This is clear. Roger Stone speaking in Cleveland. The, the Hillary Clinton you see on TV is not the real Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is a short-tempered, foul-mouthed, greedy, bipolar, uh, uh, mentally unbalanced criminal. Now, in, 1980, in the 1980s, when we had only ABC and NBC and CBS, you could suppress the truth from the American people. Today, we have the Internet. We have talk radio. We have cable TV. We have Matt Drudge. We have truth tellers. And therefore, the truth can no longer be suppressed. And the American people do not know the facts about the Clintons. They don't remember Travelgate, where Hillary had veteran public servants arrested so she could give the travel business to her cronies in Arkansas and then lied under oath about it. They don't know about Vince Foster. They told us that he died in Fort Marcy Park and his body was found 50 yards down a muddy trail. But there was no mud or dirt on his shoes. How do we know this? The FBI toxicology report. But there was carpet fiber all over his body. That's because they rolled him in a carpet. Hillary Clinton ordered that a guy named Sullivan and a guy named Kennedy, her hoodlums, her thugs, move his body because she feared that his office at the old executive office building where, he, uh, where his death occurred would become a crime scene and where the most sensitive papers that would prove the criminality of the Clintons would be subject to federal investigators. And that's Roger Stone and he's laying it out and of course he wrote the book on Hillary Clinton's crimes as well as the uh, crimes of the Bush family. We sell that at InfoWars. Uh, dot com. That's Roger Stone speaking at the America First Unity Rally in Cleveland, Ohio. You heard Alex Jones speaking earlier, exercising our First Amendment rights. And as Ale as uh, Roger Stone was just saying, they got away with a lot of this before because there wasn't an Internet to fact check them on. People couldn't research this stuff. And I thought it was interesting uh, a couple of weeks ago when uh, there was yet another case that paralleled exactly what was happening 
20 years ago when Bill Clinton was running for re-election as president. And you had the Democrat uh, National Committee as well as the Clintons involved in selling favors to Chinese businessmen and the Chinese government. And, uh, of course, all those people, the Chinese uh, people involved, Charlie Tree, many of them have now been involved in another scandal exactly 20 years later, exactly the same type of thing happening. And in the past, uh, when Charlie Tree and these others turned states' evidence, as you would usually see that happening, turning the lower people and giving them immunity so that they would testify so that you get the bigger fish moving up the uh, top, that works. That's the way it works always, except when it comes to the Clintons. And what we saw 20 years ago, they gave Charlie Tree immunity. He said, yeah, yeah, I, I sold influence. I, you know, I, I bought influence from them. They were selling it to me and so forth and so on. And they said, okay, fine, thanks. Thanks for letting us know. You, you're free to go and no crimes against the Clintons. And uh, that's what we're seeing now again. And, and it was interesting, I, as I thought as uh, Roger Stone was talking about Vince Foster, uh, as the FBI was starting to investigate this latest Clinton scandal with a Chinese businessman and Chinese government buying influence with the Clintons and with the Democrat National Committee, that one of the key figures just below Clinton, this is a very high-ranking UN figure, who was desperately seeking a plea bargain deal with the government, and he suddenly died in a weightlifting accident. He seemed to have dropped the bar on his neck and died from that. And his lawyer interestingly enough, came out and said, oh, this is, the, the Clintons didn't do this. This is not a Vince Foster type of thing. <laughs> that was his lawyer saying that. Uh, look, we all know what they've done. We can all find out what they've done. And it's just in everybody's face, as we saw with this email scandal, the fact that you would have the FBI director come out. And, uh, of course, this is a guy who was also involved in the Whitewater Whitewash, along with Loretta Lynch, uh, FBI Director Comey was also involved in giving HSBC a pass when they got caught laundering money for drug cartels and for terrorists a second time. Uh, he and Loretta Lynch were involved in that, letting them go. So they're no stranger to letting the Clintons walk. They're no strangers to letting big banks escape prosecution. And I, I was just amazed, though, when he held that press conference, laid out all the felonies that she had committed the many different times that he said that she had sent and received classified emails and said, well, but nobody in their right mind would prosecute her because you'd have to be crazy to try to send the Clintons to jail. They'll kill you, right? Or they'll kill your career at the very least. And then he said, oh, and don't you try this at home. Don't you think that this is going to set a precedent for you? Uh, you're not going to get away with this because you're not the big guy. Are we going to live in a country like that? That is the essence of of a dictatorship, of a corrupt government, when the people at the top can do anything they want and they can flaunt it in your face. You know, we talked to Lionel uh, about it, and of course, uh, he kind of leans left on a lot of issues, but he is uh, still for the rule of law. And he said, it's not enough for the Clintons to violate the law. They have to do it in a way to flaunt their violation. That's the only thing they seem to get satisfaction from. I mean, many times we've talked to him about these Supreme Court decisions, which are nothing but judicial activism. We saw Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, come after uh, Donald Trump and uh, say that uh, it weighed into the political field. So they, they've maintained this pretense in the past, and the mask has come off now. The pretense has been that the Supreme Court and the courts are legal referees. They are nothing of the sort. You understand, don't you, that they are nine politically appointed judges. They are political activists. They don't even care what the arguments are for the rule of law. If they like a particular thing, if they like the Second Amendment or if, uh, you know, the right to keep and bear arms or whatever, they, will, they don't really look at the legal arguments for it. If they like gay marriage, they will say we're going to make gay marriage legal. They don't try to find a constitutional basis for it. They're very open about the fact that they don't believe that we should look at the Constitution. They think that it's an outdated uh, document. They think that it's not relevant what uh, the words actually say or what the original intent was. It's what they would like for society to be. So they are judicial activists. And that's the fundamental problem that we have, is that the people on the left are judicial activists. And so we saw this with Ginsburg coming out and criticizing Donald Trump and even the Washington Post, which is thoroughly lost its credibility this election cycle. Uh, I mean, it has in the past been very obviously 
left leaning, but now they're not even uh, trying to even keep a pretense of objectivity. Even they came out and said she's gone too far. And she even apologized after a couple of days for speaking her mind, for taking the mask off, because they have to try to keep up the pretense that they are legal referees when they are really just judicial activists. And that's one of the fundamental issues that the American public needs to get its head around, is that we do not have a system of government that even remotely reflects the Constitution. We've had the elected representatives that we have in Congress turn over power to the president, turn over power to the Supreme Court, and mostly turn over power to an unelected, unaccountable bureaucracy that writes our laws, sets the penalties, makes them draconian, and says it doesn't matter, you don't get any due process because this is a civil action. It's not a criminal action, so you don't get your day in court. That's what we have today. We have an out-of-control bureaucracy. We have allowed this to happen. And as I'm looking at this Turkish coup that's going on, and I see uh, the European Union uh, foreign policy chief warn Turkey, this is no reason to abandon the rule of law. Do they need to have a reason to abandon the rule of law? Apparently not in the United States, not even in Europe. <laughs> so we're going to come back. When we come back, we're going to talk to our reporters as well as take a look at some developments that came. I cannot help asking those who have caused this situation. Do you realize now what you've done? Speaking nearly a month ago, President Vladimir Putin at the International Economic Forum in St. Petersburg, Russia, warned the group of international journalists there repeatedly that Europe, the United States, and Russia were drifting towards full-scale war. We know year by year what's going to happen, and they know we know. It's only you that they tell these fables and you buy it and spread it to the citizens of your countries. Your people do not feel a sense of the impending danger. This is what worries me. How do you not understand that the world is being pulled in an irreversible direction? That is the problem. But they pretend like nothing's going on. Uh, I don't even know how to get through to you people anymore. And the big news is, a month later, almost a month later, after we first reported on it, in mid-June, there has been almost no Western coverage of it at all. And that's exactly what Putin was getting at. Whether you love Putin or hate Putin, if the leader of Russia with thousands of intercontinental ballistic missiles and cruise missiles is telling the West, I don't know how to get through to you, your media is controlled, you're being manipulated, NATO is putting missiles on our borders. We're having to move missiles in. You've overthrown Ukraine. You're on an offensive. You're funding and protecting radical Islam. Do you know what you've done? Do you know what you've done? As he said at the UN, destabilizing the Middle East. Why are you doing this? Where are the sound minds across the political spectrum who should be stopping this? Russia has three overseas military bases. You have hundreds. You have your spies inside our country trying to overthrow it. You have your CIA people trying to get into our embassies. You are at war with us. And the average American, the average European, the average Brit is not aware of this. Obama, uh, Another threat that President Obama mentioned was ISIS. Well, who on earth armed them? Who helped to arm the Syrians that were fighting against Assad? Who created the necessary political climate that facilitated the situation? Who pushed for the delivery of arms to the area? But the issue of a major world leader saying that we're moving to the brink of war and it's not in our news, that's the big story. It shows how incredibly controlled things are. Please spread this video far and wide and hopefully it will spur a debate that can cause some type of chain reaction that reverses our course or at least changes our course from assured Armageddon.
but they will pay attention when we the people force the issue. And we are forcing the issue on this, as well as many other issues going on here in the United States and around the world. I'm Alex Jones signing off for InfoWars.com. If you're watching or listening to this transmission, you are the hope. You are the resistance. Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight in studio. We have our reporters and Alex Jones in Cleveland at the RNC. They're going to be joining us later. Uh, before we go back to them, I want to play a clip of Sheriff Clark talking to Don Lemon. This is a pretty heated exchange about the recent police shootings between the two of them. Uh, let's play that clip. Anti-police rhetoric is based on a lie. There is no data, and you know this, there is no data, there is no research that proves any of that nonsense. None. Even... It, you'd have to be more specific about what data and what nonsense you're talking about. That law enforcement officers treat black males different than white males in policing in these urban There centers. is data that's... Important. There is not data. I don't know. The, the president the president spoke about it cedric alexander the who is president law enforcement has been officer. lying about it he said it again the other day when he said black males are two times more likely to be shot by a law enforcement officer than white males. don that is a lie that is not a lie it is the a lie yeah. show me research show that, me the research show that it we to me have with that we have from the washington post that, that the Washington Post study debunked that nonsense. Is also research. He also said Sheriff, this time. There's also research. He from continues. A Harvard professor that also showed that black people are treated more aggressively by police officers. No, you are than other wrong people. in your interpretation of that Harvard study because I read the study. That's not what he said. He that said he was surprised to find he was surprised that to find that in shootings of the of the most severe in shootings that he found no evidence that there was a difference. All right, so we can also, go back and forth again. And what this illustrates to me is the dueling statistics. You can twist statistics to say anything you want. Okay, you can play games with numbers. You can couch these numbers. I remember when they want to raise the sales tax in places where I live. When they say they'd have a 5% sales tax. And they say, we're going to raise sales tax by a penny. It's like, oh, well, gee, who could oppose that? That's such a trivial amount, okay? But if you've got a 5% sales tax and you're going to raise it to 6%, that's a 20% increase in sales tax, okay? So you can play your numbers games any way that you want to uh, cut it. And, you know, really, they're both right to one degree or the other. The sheriff is saying, look, there's more white people that are killed by police. Uh, the fact that you have, uh, uh, when you normalize it to the population, you have about two and a half times more black people killed by police. But that doesn't even speak to the fact of whether or not the people were killed unjustly, whether that was a justified killing, whether it was in self-defense. So that the statistics don't really tell you anything. Here is what I think tells you something. And this is what we talked about earlier today. The fact that this guy who shot these three cops, who actually shot six cops, three are dead, one is in critical condition, and two of the people that he shot were very much like him. And they had absolutely no connection to this killing that has still uh, yet to be uh, looked at in the courts. One of them was black like the shooter. Another was an ex-Marine like the shooter. And as his sister said, you know, we're getting to the point where no lives matter. And this cop, this black cop who was killed, who had a four-month-old child, said, "Can't, please don't let hate infect your heart. He said, I love this city, but I wonder if this city loves me. See, part of the problem is what we're asking the police to do. One of the things that we have not talked about in all of this is the war on drugs. We're asking the police to go around and use law enforcement as a tool to stop drug addiction. That's a medical issue. But what we have seen is for the last 40 years, this unconstitutional war on drugs, understand the alcohol prohibition that we had, never targeted end users. 
And it was done legally. They had to amend the Constitution. Why do we have a constitutional amendment? To give them the power to prohibit alcohols. Because they don't have it under the Constitution otherwise. And we had another amendment to take away that power. But the whole time they did that, they didn't wage war on the end users. They went after the guys like Al Capone who were uh, selling it, the gangsters, okay? Now what they did under Reagan, they went after the end users. They took away private property rights with civil asset forfeiture, saying that your, your car or your plane or your home committed the crime, and they don't even need to find you guilty. They don't even need to charge you with a crime to just take away your property. Where are the conservative Republicans on that? With one fell swoop, they took away your property rights. Don't you realize what they've done? Don't you realize that it's the war on drugs that's been behind the militarization of the police? We got a article on the Drudge Report talking about the soaring prison population prompts Thailand to rethink the fact that they lost the drug war. They have a prison population there that is four times what the other Southeastern Asian countries have. And they said it's not working. And they only have been in this for a decade. We have been in this for 45 years. And it's a UN agenda. The UN even created the schedule. We're Can on we the wake march. Up? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, your host. I want to go back and uh, talk to uh, talk about what is really behind, I believe, the problems with the police. I think we're asking the cops to do too much. I think we're asking them to do the wrong things. I think we're asking them to do it in the wrong way. I think we need more local control, not federalized control, not militarized police. I think we need to take a look at privatization. If you want to call in and sound off on that, what you think the problem is between uh, the Black Lives Matter, George Soros, AstroTurf uh, movement that has risen up here. And I would say it's really the only Black Lives Matter is what they're telling everybody. Uh, they're not really interested in reforming the police. Look, every institution needs to constantly either be improving or it's going to be constantly getting worse. And like all the other branches of our government, the police should not be above reform and improvement. And there are areas for improvement. That's not to say that any of these assassinations of the police are justified. They're not. They're not even connected to what's happened. I mean, they're not even trying to come after the people that uh, they believe committed these crimes. I mean, this, this is just random acts of violence. It's directed at the police. It's also directed at white people. Uh, this is uh, just nothing but racism and civil war that's being promoted by our president, by the Democratic uh, Party, by Hillary Clinton, because that is the way they get power. Now, I want to take your calls. Uh, the number is 800-259-9231. That's 800-259-9231. Uh, before we go back uh, to the news and go to your calls, I just want to remind you, that we still have the Hillary for Prison t-shirts. You can get it at InfoWarsStore.com. You saw a lot of the people at the America First Unity Rally there in Cleveland had their Hillary for Prison t-shirts. It's the same design you've seen flying behind the airplane this uh, last uh, several days in Cleveland. And you will see it uh, featured at the Democrat uh, Party in one way or the other, I'm sure, as well. There it is right there if you're watching the video feed. Uh, you can get that design on your shirt, and you can fly that around. It cracks me up every time I see that. <laughs> That's a great, uh, great sign. I'm glad that Alex did that. Uh, and, of course, we it's your purchase of those T-shirts and the products that we sell that allow us to uh, send our reporters to these conventions to cover other live news outlets, as well as uh, it gives us the opportunity to uh, thank you with our specials from time to time. We have uh, put... Our premier product, our most expensive product, DNA Force on sale. Uh, it's very expensive. As I point out before, BioPQQ, in the form that we get it, there's only one company that does that. It's very expensive to get it. It's about $30,000 per batch. And DNA Force is loaded with patented BioPQQ compound. It's backed by 175 clinical studies. You can do the research yourself. We can't connect the dots for you. We can't make any claims or draw any conclusions about products that we sell. But you can do the research. That's what the Internet is for. Look at these clinical studies. Look at what people say on InfoWarsLife.com, reviews about this product, about our other products that we sell. Uh, decide for yourself if this is something that uh, you need. It is very potent in antioxidant activity, many, many times more than you'll find in anything else, uh, vitamin, any, any source of vitamin C or anything else. And again, it is 25% off. It's one of our premier products. It is a huge savings at that price, and we thank you for supporting us uh, your purchase of our products is what funds our operation. We don't look at uh, 
uh, charitable contributions uh, from people. We don't get government funding. We don't take uh, outside advertisers who can shut off our revenue stream. Uh, we sell directly to you the best products that we can find and produce. Now, before I go to your calls, I want to finish up on what's going on in Thailand. Because I said before, the problem with what's going on in our police departments is that we don't have local control. We don't have enough accountability with the police, but we're also asking them to do the wrong things. I and mean, why do we have a situation where the police in New York would choke to death a man who was selling individual cigarettes because it's a difference in the tax revenue that's there? Well, we've had situation. Look at New York is a very good example. We had Adrian Schoolcraft, who was a whistleblower cop, and he documented with a recording years of what he was being told, how they were giving him quotas, how they were telling him to harass people for minor violations so they could get money. They said uh, when it was Halloween, they said, go out and arrest three people, bring them back, and then go out and get another three. We'll work out what the charges will be at a later time. He got that on recording, okay? Adrian Schoolcraft. This is the same town that had the stop and frisk laws where they could just stop you walking down the street and frisk you for no apparent reason, just searching for some kind of a violation. And when you come at people like that, it creates a friction. And eventually it creates a violence that's not necessary, as we saw with Eric Garner. People get tired of it and the things begin to escalate and then many times it ends in death or unjustified brutality. I mean, take a look at the other laws that they have in New York City, for example. They... For example, barbers could not smoke in their own barbershop because they made that illegal. So you had some barbers who would say, all right, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go stand outside my barbershop and smoke on the sidewalk. Then the police fined them heavy fines for loitering in front of their own store. So what are you going to do? I mean, they got you coming and going. And what Adrian Schoolcraft pointed out with these recordings was they were encouraged to do these minor non-crimes so they could generate revenue. Meanwhile, when it came to something like car theft or rape, and they were called to the scene, they would tell somebody, well, you really don't want to prosecute this person for rape because they're going to drag you through the coals. You really don't want to go through this whole process of trying to uh, process this car theft because it's going to take so much of your time. It's just going to destroy your life. It's going to cost you your job. Or it's going to cost take time away from your business or whatever. So they would talk people out of prosecuting these things. They would say, well, you know, yeah, it really wasn't a stolen car. I forgot. I loaned it to my cousin or whatever. They really did that. Why would they do that? They would do that so they would look good on the FBI crime statistics. But they wanted the money. So they would hassle people endlessly over the minor vi uh, violations. And when the cops in New York City found out that Adrian Schoolcraft, who was the son of a cop, he and his dad were as honest as you'll find anybody. These are real cops. And, and they punished him at first by putting him on a, a beat where he had to walk a neighborhood. He said, that's what I want to do. That's real uh, police work. See, that's the way the police ought to be used, as a peace officer, as security guards, instead of somebody who is enforcing policy and grabbing fines like glorified meter maids. That's an abuse of the police by the city government. And the police chiefs are not elected by the people unlike the sheriffs, okay? Now, when they found out about this, they went to his apartment. And he had a recording device on him again. And they uh, said, oh, so you think you're really smart recording all this stuff and anything? And they, they searched him, they took that off of him, and they took him away and put him in a mental institution. Put him in a mental institution. They committed him to a mental institution. His dad, who was a cop, knew that he was having problems, started looking for him, couldn't find him for several days, and he found him because he went to his apartment and found a second recorder that was up on the bookshelf. And they didn't know about that one. And so that had the entire conversation that they weren't able to delete and destroy. And it gave him an idea. He knew then, at least, he didn't know which one they'd taken him to. But they knew that he'd, they'd taken him to a mental institution to put him away. Just like they tried to kill Frank Serpico when he exposed corruption in the New York Police Department. And it's not just New York. This is something that is coming out of the federal government. And it's really something that is coming out of the war on drugs, which came from the United Nations. The United Nations created the entire schedule of the war on drugs. Can't conservatives understand that? Conservatives who are such diehard supporters of the war on drugs. Can't you understand that incarcerating people 
killing people, hitting them over the head with a stick is not going to stop drug addiction. It's a spiritual issue. It's a mental issue. It is a medical issue. It is not a law enforcement issue. When you make it a law enforcement issue, you corrupt this government and you don't get what you want. It just simply gets worse. And that's what's happened for 45 years. It was created, all the schedules that we have and all the drugs and all the schedules were created 10 years before Nixon declared the war on drugs and used it as a clone. Just as we see happening with Agenda 21, with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainability. The UN creates these templates. We see it also with... Um, ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, they will create legislation as a template. Then they'll have a, a uh, get-together at uh, a, a swanky uh, vacation resort and, and pull in uh, Republican mostly, but also Democrat legislators. Give them the legislation and say, here it is. It's got a blank here where you fill in your name and the state, and this is the legislation that we want for business purposes. Okay, This is a common thing. This is corruption. Pure and simple. So how is this working out for Thailand? They're starting to get the idea. Unlike America, we've been doing this for 45 years. They've been doing it for 10 years. Here's a guy, 18 years old, when he was jailed for selling illegal drugs. Reuters reports now he's turning 30. He's not even halfway through his 33-year sentence at Bangkok's high-security prison. And his family said uh, he's just he was just a kid. He wasn't a big-time dealer, his older brother said. He, and he said this. He said, we are also serving time, waiting for him to get out. So he can help the family. See, it destroys the families as well. And we're not even talking about the American government's involvement in creating uh, heroin in Afghanistan. Afghanistan's production of uh, heroin was uh, down to a very small amount. It really had shrunk under the Taliban. Once we came in, started helping people to produce it, it has set new records every year. And it's now about 90% of the world's supply of that is coming out of the areas that we control. Our CIA, just like we had the crack cocaine epidemic from the CIA, from the Reagan administration that was invented by the CIA and brought in. It was exposed by uh, Gary Webb and Dark Alliance, how they uh, did a war of drugs on the black community, on the rest of America with the crack cocaine epidemic. That was created to fund their secret wars by our secret government. But they go on. They say a decade after they've done this, uh, the prison population is soaring. Uh, the difference is, is that they didn't go in and uh, get some crony capitalists to agree to build all the prisons. All you people who think that Gary Johnson's uh, against the war on drugs, you should take a look at what he did with private prisons and the war on drugs when he was governor of New Mexico. Okay, he was in on that rig. Okay, just like they have now jettisoned their principles of supporting the Second Amendment and the Libertarian Party is simply interested in getting enough votes that they can get money from the federal government. When I was involved with the Libertarian Party, if a candidate said that he wanted to get uh, federal matching funds, it was a disqualifying thing. Most of us in the Libertarian Party at that point would say, no thanks, you're violating our principles. They're violating their principles left and right now. They also talk about this. I mean, their prison conditions are even worse than ours. They've got a cell that's about five by 10, and they sleep five inmates in there side by side on the floor, okay? But they have four times the number of people in prison as the average of the uh, other Asian nations. And they've just said this. The world has lost the war on drugs. Not only Thailand. Federal gov uh, a uh, official with the Thailand government says, we have clear numbers that drug use here has increased over the past three years. Another indicator is that there's more prisoners, okay? Well... We have that same information, and we seem to be unable to connect the dots. We seem to be unable to connect the dots that when you create a war on the population, things are going to get violent. What do you think? We're going to have a war, on, a war of drugs on the population for 45 years? Of course it's going to eventually get violent. That truly is the root of this, the fact that we are misusing our police, that we have absolutely no control, no accountability in the process, and we are not at all interested in how the um, Constitution applies to our liberties, to our due process. We've said uh, for the sake of uh, the war on drugs, we're just going to shut this down. Let's go to one of our callers. Let's go to uh, Margaret in Ohio. Margaret. Go ahead. Um, hello, oh, Margaret sorry. in Oklahoma. Oklahoma, yes. Oklahoma. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I wanted to talk about Schaefer-Cox. Okay. Um, that our... our um, uh, 
Department of Justice is totally, completely corrupt, not just a little, not just halfway, but completely corrupt, that uh, Eric Holder um, pressured uh, prosecutors to lie and cheat and break laws to put Schaefer Cox into prison. Um, the FBI, he wrote a, oh, for his speech, he wrote a speech, um, um, he made a, uh, a, did a lecture in Montana that's called The Solution to Reclaiming Liberty. And for that, and because, hello? Yes, I'm listening. I'm not familiar okay. with uh, Schaefer Cox, so yeah, tell us about that story. He, he was case. in Alaska, and, and he did a lecture in Montana called The Solution to Reclaiming Liberty. And the uh, FBI didn't like that, and they didn't like that he was the leader of a 3,500-man militia in Fairbanks, Alaska. And so they, they, plot, they, they tried to entrap him with a plot to kill police. Actually, they call them troopers in Alaska. But he, they tried to make a plot, and he kept saying no. And uh, they, they have tapes of him saying no. But the, the um, prosecutors um, made up a, a myth that he had planned to plot to kill these police. And uh, the, the, the kangaroo court was not allowed to hear any, the jury was not allowed to hear anything in his defense. And they put him into prison for 26 years. And he's been in prison six years now. And his case is so obviously illegal it's com completely uh, 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 beyond reason. Anybody who anybody who honestly reviews it would throw it out. But it's been six years. Yeah. Nobody will stand up for him. Well, and, and we see these kinds of cases over and over again. Uh, this is not an uncommon template. I'm not familiar with the specifics of Schaefer Cox. But just look at the uh, situation that was a bit more well-known of uh, Thomas Drake, who's one of the whistleblowers. And contrast that to what they did with Hillary Clinton. And I've talked about this before, how they went into, he was a whistleblower. Uh, they went into his apartment. They found some documents, none of which were classified. Uh, one of them was a schedule for a project that was finished. It didn't have any information on it. It was uh, marked unclassified. They said, well, that's a, that should have been classified and you should have known it. So we're going to charge you with having a classified document. Uh, another one was not uh, classified. It was just like, uh, what a success. And just talking in general terms about a, a project and that had finished, and um, it didn't have any specifics about what the project was about, and uh, it was not classified. They classified it that day and charged him with a vi classification violation, and they declassified that three months later. Now, their case fell apart as they went to prosecution because it got press coverage. But, you know, this is a case where they invented charges against Drake, and they invented an excuse against Hillary Clinton when she did it by the thousands and did it deliberately, went to a great deal of trouble to create this server. And they give her a pass. So, yeah, we do have two separate uh, justice systems. Let me ask you this. You said that uh, he got convicted. What do you think is the solution to this? Because I don't think we're going to be able to get the right people elected in Congress to do something about this. We've we've had these kinds of problems for a very long time. I think the problem, uh, the solution to this problem is for people to understand jury nullification and start doing things at a local level. What do you think? Um, I think the solution is to shine a lot of light on it. Yeah. People don't even know about Schaefer Cox. If people knew about it, they would be furious. Uh, Pastor Manning, uh, he was uh, he um, was was interviewing uh, uh, Rudy Davis and. Um, uh, uh, um, um, he was re interviewing Rudy Davis of uh, Austin about Schaefer, and he was really broken. He, he was really, he, the, the, when he heard the details of, of the horrible things they did to this guy. Well, it, I'll look a, into it. Really I'll look into it. I mean, we had a congressman, remember, who was uh, tied up and transported around the country. They call it dieseling uh, because he was coming after the IRS. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight here in Austin. We're going to go out to our callers in just one moment. I want to go to Tom in Maryland, who is a retired cop. Uh, before we do, real quickly, I just want to remind you that we have a special on DNA Force. I'm not sure how much longer that's going to last, but it is 25% off our premier product at InfoWarsLife.com. Uh, it will sell out uh, pretty quickly. It's something that's very difficult for us to produce, very expensive to produce. Uh, so that 25% uh, off is a big savings. It's not going to last much longer. Also, something I haven't talked about today, and that is our uh, Ghost Smile Sonic Pro tooth whitening toothbrush. And uh, I have a Sonic Pro. I'm going to upgrade to this uh, because this one, besides having the Sonic vibration, of course, I, I got my Sonic Pro years ago because I had a, a dentist recommend it to me, and it really has been the most effective toothbrush I've ever had. It's, it's worlds apart. Well, this is 
a bit different. This has some added features. It's not only got the uh, sonic vibration that uh, vibrates the average of 27,000 times per minute, but it also has a, um, a, a blue wavelength technology that you use with a special gel. It helps to whiten your teeth as well as to kill bacteria. Now, Alex's dad has been a practicing dentist for 30 years. He says it's the best uh, tooth whitening system he's seen in his practice. And, of course, you can do this without uh, toxic chemicals or expensive doctor visits. It's a great way to whiten your teeth, uh, to uh, purify your mouth. And right now we have a special as part of the introductory offer, 25% off your second system, your second Go Smile Sonic Pro system, as part of our exclusive listener special at InfoWarsStore.com. So that and the 25% off in, uh, DNA Force at InfoWars Life. Uh, let's go back to our callers right now. Uh, Tom in Maryland, go ahead. Hi, David. If I could firstly uh, extend my condolences to the families of the uh, police that were slain in Baton yes. Rouge. Um, I'd like them to know that uh, your extended family uh, and law enforcement are, are mourning with you and praying for you. And I got to uh, say now, that, you know, even though I, I'm not a cop, I mean, I, I, I hate to see innocent people killed. And, and this is the situation. These people were innocent people. They have families. This, this one guy, as I point out, he, you know, this is the, the killer was a black Marine. He killed a black man. He killed an ex-Marine, just like him. We focus on the differences instead of what we have in common. And these people had families, a four-month-old, and the other guy had uh, at least uh, had four children. I'm not sure about the uh, third uh, officer who died there. But it, it is a tragedy, yes. And, David, it's worth saying, it's important to say that... In my entire career, and, and I've worked not only here stateside, but also overseas, um, I've never met a police officer who felt good about taking a life, regardless of what the circumstances were. Anytime a life is taken in the line of duty, um, that is something that bothers us deeply. Yeah. Now, I would I would expect that. I mean, only only a a sick pathological individual individual celebrates murdering people, and that's what we've seen out of these people who have been hyped up with the only Black Lives Matter movement. And it is simply a pathological hatred that is motivating this. I have witnessed on many many occasions where the legal bar for using deadly force was clearly met, and officers will do whatever they can to not have to go that route. I've been there myself, and believe me, if police were shooting people, every time the legal bar was met to use deadly force, there'd be bodies everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and people should, should know that. Um, now, are mistakes made? Sure, they're, they're made. And officers should pay the price, depending on the circumstances. Uh, I hate to see media and politicians rush to judgment, though, because that only serves to fuel the flames and put ideas in people's heads that maybe give them ideas. I agree. We're out, of, we're out of time. Hang on. We'll come back to you right after the break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. We're going to go back to our callers in just a moment. But right now we have Diamond and Silk live at the America First Unity Rally. And I want to cut to that live feed that we've got there. Here's Diamond and Silk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we go and we commit a crime, don't uh, they arrest us? They arrest us. Uh-huh. When yeah. I go, and, and, and let's talk about the immigration problem that we're having, the illegal immigration problem we're having in our country. Yes. When I go up and walk up in your house, ain't that breaking and entering? That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, Why yeah. the hell hadn't somebody been arrested? They breaking up into America's house? Uh-huh. Why? That's breaking and entering, That's ain't breaking that? breaking and entering. Uh -huh. yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Don't you secure your house? Don't you? Ain't the White House secure? Isn't it? But why isn't America House secure? Mm -hmm. Think That's about right. that, yeah. okay? Yeah. When we talk about our jobs, you uh -huh. all, why would you take and you outsource our good jobs? Why? To have us sitting here riding dirty. Yeah. Living in poverty. Yes. Sitting around looking crazy. Yes. Underemployed yes. and unemployed. Why would you do that? Yes. Again, that's Diamond and, and Silk. They're talking about our open immigration policy home. saying if somebody breaks and enters into your house... Uh, wouldn't you do something about it? I thought it was interesting. That was the same way that a, uh, a Cuban mayor explained it to his wife when she said, why are you supporting Donald Trump? And he says, well, if somebody 
uh, moves into our house without our permission and they won't leave, uh, what would you do? I, I would call the police. And she goes, oh, okay, I understand that. She goes, and he said, I convinced her to vote for Donald Trump. That's fundamentally the, the analogy that we have to understand, okay, folks. That, that's, uh, that's there. But we've been talking to our callers. I was talking to uh, Tom in Maryland, who is a retired cop. I want to go back to uh, Tom talking about uh, his perspective as a police officer. And, Tom, I want to ask you, uh, from what I was saying there in terms of some of the things that we ask our uh, police to do, we had the Dallas police chief in the wake of the shootings there. He said, uh, we're being asked to do too much. We're being asked to solve all the problems of society. Let me ask you specifically about the war on drugs. Do you believe that that is fundamentally a law enforcement uh, issue, or is that really something that uh, should best be addressed by uh, treatment for addiction? I mean, can, can law enforcement really solve addiction? We've had 45 years to try to do that. Let me say full disclosure, I'm a big supporter of police law enforcement against prohibition. I do no. not believe that we should be criminalizing uh, drug usage Good. I think that it should be decriminalized. In fact, I told you I worked overseas with this in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And when we decriminalized drugs over there, they're not legal, by the way. They, they were decriminalized. And uh, the, the effect was amazing. In fact, uh, to this day, you can still walk in if you're an addict and you sign up for a program. You can walk into a government-sponsored program a facility and get free heroin. Yes. And yes. I know that might sound crazy to some people, but David, it got bodies off the street. Yes. It got crime reduced. It was amazing. Well, and, people and don't and understand. I mean, we look at alcohol prohibition. You had people, you know, dri doing drive by shootings with uh, Tommy guns during alcohol prohibition. That stopped when they made it uh, legal. They still have controls over it. And it's still against the law to sell it to children and so forth and so on. And we have drunk driving laws and, and things like that. But, you know, that's the difference between prohibition and this other stuff. And I have the utmost respect for law enforcement against prohibition. I've interviewed uh, representatives from there, uh, Jim Garrock, uh, multiple times on the show. David, if we haven't realized by now, at a cost of $40 billion per year, that the drug war it is, has been lost... It never was about really uh, harm reduction, as they have you believe. Then, then we're blind. Yes. yes. And and don't be blind is what is what my message is because the folks that are behind this, like I said, this is a forty billion dollar a year industry. It's a business. Yes. And and it's not about helping people. It's not about saving lives. It's about making money. And by the way, supporting drug cartels because with the type of enforcement that we do, who's the only folks that are left that can actually get the drugs in? It's the cartels. Yes. It, and they get a free pass. The Sinaloa cartel has uh, its own checkout window at HSBC, and they get away with it. Thank you so much, Tom. Marilyn, uh, retired cop, will be back with more. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show on this Monday, July 18th, 2016. I'm David Knight here in the studio. Our reporters are in Cleveland, Ohio. We've been uh, checking in on the America First Unity Rally that was put together by Roger Stone, Alex Jones. We've heard both of them speak. We just had a, a clip from uh, Diamond and Silk. Uh, they're at the rally, and others are speaking. We'll be checking in periodically with them and with our reporters. We're going to go back to your calls here. And if you want to uh, join in on the conversation, the number is 800-259-9231. That's 800-259-9231. Let's go to Walt in Michigan. Go ahead, Walt. Hey, how are you doing, Dave? Doing good. I got, I got something to share with you that goes exactly with going uh, on in our country today. It hasn't changed. In over um, 161 years, matter of fact, when a book I just got done reading called The Crisis by J. Wayne Lorenz, L-A-U-R-E-N-S, about free trade, the same phrase they use today that the British was using against our country back then. Mm -hmm. Putting our people out of work, our businesses were being shut down because of no tariffs on imports. Yes. They took the tariffs off, and we've been suffering ever since then. That's right. Now, it's interesting, that's, isn't uh, it, that when also, they, it's interesting, I think, that when they created the Federal Reserve, they created the income tax, 
when they created the income tax, they said, we're going to shift the tax burden from tariffs at the border to the income tax. So they gave us an income tax, and then they took down the uh, tax on goods and services coming in at the border. And that hasn't worked out very well for us. I, I prefer what Thomas Jefferson did when he said in his uh, second inaugural address, he was only the third president, and they'd already uh, added a bunch of taxes uh, to people, uh, various excise taxes internally. Of course, they didn't have the audacity to violate the Constitution that soon and, and uh, have any kind of direct taxation on people. But he said in his second inaugural address that in his first term, he'd eliminated all internal taxation. And they had funded the government, which was then the size of the Constitution. They had funded it strictly with uh, duties on uh, products that were coming into the country. And so they had a free trade zone within America. And we traded freely amongst ourselves, and we built up an economy that was largely self-sufficient. We have the resources here. We have the human resources. We have the material resources. We have the energy resources here in America that we could do that here today. And what we're seeing is uh, these globalists are exporting our jobs. They're importing workers. They're exporting our wealth is what they're doing. We're so told that we need to get rid of our manufacturing economy, replace it with a service economy. The service economy now is not good enough. We're going to replace that with a gig economy where we work for Uber and things until they get their machines in, and then we won't have any jobs at all. Uh, that's that's really the path that we're heading down with this. And, and that's why I think it is so important uh, that we have uh, someone who is going to, who has, throughout his life, Donald Trump, has opposed these trade deals that have been a bad deal. Let me ask you, uh, Walt, do you think that, uh, does it concern you that uh, he's picked uh, Pence as his running mate who has supported every one of these trade deals? Yes, I do. I have a large concern about it because Pence supported TPP, yes. and I believe he supported NAFTA. Yes, and uh, CAFTA. I, I view him as a traitor, and why would he choose a traitor? That's what I see Mr. Pence to be. Yeah. Yeah. He's no different than the other guys that are in D.C., whether they're Democrats or Republicans. All them rats are involved in betraying us. And by the way, I need to share a little bit more about that book. It's important to see the correlation to now. Uh, the, all the manufacturing machining, okay, was being done in England. And they were importing all the manufacturing and raw materials were being produced in England. And... All the, when all the gold and silver that the colonists and Americans had then, wooden colonists in the States then, gave all the gold and silver for the products that were coming in, then they started issuing creditary notes. Yeah. Just like they're doing today with the Federal Reserve. Yeah. So what happened when they couldn't pay anymore, when they, when they, when they wouldn't accept any more creditary notes, they confiscated their land. Yeah. The largest landowner, David, in New York City, was Cardinal Hughes of New York, the largest landlord and property owner in New York. You need to look up the draft riots and what happened in the demand for free farming equipment, money, and uh, seed, seed, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, for people who were foreign immigrants, weren't even American citizens, demanding all these things free from our government and from us, Okay, or they're going to riot, burn the place down, and beat the hell out of everybody with clubs. That's right. I got the entire transcripts in that book I just mentioned. Jay Wayne Lorenz wrote The Crisis, and you'll find out the full transcripts of the union leaders or organizers in New York that made big speeches and even went to the government offices with the same speeches demanding it or else. You no, know, it's interesting. You talk about this historical book, and we go back and we read what happened in history, and we find that 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, the principles haven't changed. You know, so when we hear people say, well, you know, Second Amendment, that was written at a time when we didn't really have dangerous guns. It's like baloney. Now, those guns were very dangerous, very dangerous. And they were state-of-the-art guns that they uh, had uh, people owning. Or they say things like, uh, well, you know, the Electoral College, uh, that, that didn't apply because, uh, you know, people... Uh, had to uh, ride their horses to Washington to give the votes or some kind of nonsense like that. They understood the principles that were involved, and the principles have not changed. And when we go back and look at history, we see the same types of issues coming up again and again. You're just talking about uh, what was happening about 150 years ago. Look, one of the key uh, divi divisions between the North and South uh, were on things like uh, free trade or protectionist trade. They were on issues of crony capitalism. 
the Republican Party was very much uh, in favor of crony capitalism. The, the uh, South was very much opposed to the idea that they would have to subsidize an Erie Canal uh, in the Northeast. They said, why would we pay money to a federal government that would subsidize something like that? Where's the benefit to the people in our area? So they were very much opposed to that. But at the same time, they wanted open trade with Britain. And uh, so you had the mercantilists who were trying to protect their markets. We see these same types of issues don't go away because they're about principles. And just because we're building different machines now, people are still the same. Human nature doesn't change. That's why the Constitution is so valuable. We had people who created the Constitution, who created our form of government that understood human nature, which doesn't change. We have the same issues, the same power struggles, the same groups coming after each other, and we can learn a great deal from history. Uh, people have been right and wrong on both sides of this issue. It's a, it's a, a great thing to go back and look at that. I appreciate that, uh, Walt. Let's go. Let's, I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to uh, talk. Let's go to uh, Chris in Georgia. Chris, you want to talk about Black Lives Matter. Go ahead. Hello, David Knight, and thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening. Yes, I called because I want to give my opinion of the police and Black Lives Matter. Okay. My take for Black Lives Matter is a comment from a Trump fan on his Facebook page, and it is, quote, If the American police really wanted black people dead, all they have to do is stop patrolling their neighborhood and wait for them to kill themselves. Black lives only matter as long as it's not black on black killings. And, um, end quote. And mm -hmm. what Black Lives Matter do is terror-like. They advocate for the killing of cops, who, for the most part, protect us. And many people go along with it like it's fine. But we can't agree that our police do have a problem. I agree with you that it's mainly, be, it's mainly the feds and the cleaners that put these policies in place to keep the jails full, to keep them militarized, and to some extent target minorities. There are problems on both sides, but Black Lives Matter does absolutely nothing to stop it. I agree. It, it doesn't offer a solution at all. It offers... Hatred and racism and division. And as I've said many times before, look, if you firmly believe uh, that uh, regardless of whether you believe that you're being unjust, I will say, put it this way. If you believe that you are being singled out as a black person, why wouldn't you try to convince white people that this is also their problem instead of pushing them away? Why wouldn't you come together with them to try to solve the problem, especially if you feel like you're being singled out? So this whole idea of Black Lives Matter to me, understanding, and as we've seen multiple times, how it is funded by George Soros, we understand that they are trying to work against any improvement in the way the police interact with the society. They don't want to have uh, the police functioning correctly. What they want to have is a conflict between white and black, between uh, black and the police. They're trying to create more conflict. They're not trying to create a solution. If they wanted a solution, they would join together with people and say, let's find a common solution. Let's work together in a peaceful way. They want to promote hate. hate and that's what we've seen George Soros funding around the world with his color revolutions. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And on what, it, what I was about to say, um, it seems as if they want more violence by committing violence. And David, as a 15-year-old black teen, I'll say that Black Lives Matter is nothing more than a terrorist organization funded by George Soros. There's nothing good out of it. And I want to say this, all lives matter. Yes, yes. And that's the whole key, isn't it? The fact that they get triggered, that they get so angry when people say, well, all lives matter. Let's all work together. Let's all figure out how we're going to live together peacefully, how we want our police to uh, police the uh, uh, society here. What laws we're going to have? Uh, do we really want to have this war on drugs? Or is it creating unnecessary violence and, and giving organized crime a very dangerous monopoly on a very lucrative black market? Many people, just as I was talking to the retired police officer from Maryland, uh, many people who are retired police officers, who are retired judges and prosecutors, they got into this because they see the problems with drugs. I, I understand there's a problem with drugs. I don't use drugs. My children don't use drugs. I don't want to use drugs. I don't want to get rid of drug prohibition so I can use drugs. I want to get rid of the problems that prohibition has caused. Prohibition is a problem. Prohibition corrupts us, creates a violent society. And that's one of the key issues of friction between the black community and the police. And it isn't necessary to have it done that way. That's why we need to come together, white and black, to address the real problems. And Soros doesn't want that to happen. Stay with us. We're going to take more of your calls. 
here on the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. We're taking your calls. I'm going to go back to the callers in just one moment. I want to remind you that we have a special on DNA Force. It's not going to last much longer. It's 25% off at InfoWarsLife.com. Of course, your purchasing of our products that we sell is the uh, wind in our sails. It's also the fuel in our airplane as we fly the uh, Hillary for Prison banner uh, over Cleveland the last uh, several days. And of course, you can also get that Hillary for Prison t-shirt. You can uh, wave that banner yourself. But uh, DNA Force is not going to be on sale for very much longer. It's a big discount. That's our uh, premier product in terms of price, in terms of uh, the ingredients that we have in it. Our Bio PQQ compound is patented. Very difficult to get, very expensive to produce. Takes a while to produce a batch. When we sell out of it, it takes a while to replace it. And uh, we are offering that now as a thank you to our listeners. 25% off at InfoWarsLife.com. DNA Force. I want to go back to our callers right now. Let's go to um, Jacob in Texas. Go ahead, Jacob. Hey there, David. Hey. Um, um, long-time listener, first-time caller. Uh, I want to talk about Black Lives Matter as well and what I witnessed. Um, I remember waking up, you know, whenever it was well, uh, Bat uh, Baton Rouge and then, you know, before that in Dallas, you know, and both times I had, what I had witnessed was was white people. One, the first time it was an EMT guy came in and did something to eat, and he, he's watching. And he says, "You know, MS uh, those guys kill them all." And I was like, and I was just. I mean, the thing is, it was sad to see. You know, this division. It's like what you talked about earlier. You know, it's division. It's purposely trying to divide the country and you know give support to this minority. It's really you know sad yes. as somebody who's you know still in high school and just you know, trying to get through it without having to, you know, step on any toes, so to speak. You know, I'm not trying to, you know, be timid or anything, but at the same time, it's just sad to see it this, see this, and then... Well, you're just trying to get you know, along. You don't have a chip on your shoulder because of somebody's skin color, but this is something that has been sold, and I'm sure you have seen this a lot in school. This is something that was put into our schools by the 60s radicals like uh, Bill Ayers. They incorporated this white skin privilege and and, and just preaching racism and division as a tool of social and political control. And it has really, really just gone viral in the last several years. We've seen the manifestation of it. it it's gotten to a critical mass, and it really is, is coming through the schools and the universities. That's where I see it being injected into society in such a, a massive amount. But now we've seen the people who have gone through the educational propaganda, the indoctrination that they get in schools, they're now out in the media, they're in, the, in politics and political field, and, and they're now pushing this agenda along with the radicalized students. And that's why this has gotten so dangerous. Uh, they're not interested in uh, correcting any problems. Uh, they simply want a war. That's what this is about. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, you know, it's, that's one of the, you know, it's the Democrats that started this, you know. They're, you know, against it, you know, supporting the KKK at the beginning, and now they're supporting, you know, saying that they were on the black side the whole time, and it's the Republicans, you know, that's one reason why people should go and see Hillary's America, you know, um, by Dinesh D'Souza, great movie, I was lucky enough to meet the guy, ask him a question, and get his thoughts on the matter, and it was very interesting and enlightening. And I think it's amazing. He, he's a great he's a great example of uh, somebody that did not deserve to go to prison. I and mean, we've never had anybody go to prison for a minor violation of uh, campaign finance laws before. And look at all the different things that, that Hillary Clinton has done: violated the religion of the national security state, created a, her own private network in order to do that. Uh, arguably, she was uh, creating a system where she had. Uh, uh, plausible deniability that she was giving away secrets. I mean, I, I can't understand why any idiot would do something like that. But she put her own privacy, her own criminal operation ahead of national security, and she gets away with it. And yet Dinesh D'Souza, because he does a political-based uh, uh, documentary that they don't like, uh, they find something, some minor violation, which nobody has ever, as I said, gone to prison. They've, they've been fined for that type of thing before. It was innocent. It wasn't uh, conspiring with uh, Chinese businesses in order to get millions of dollars so that, uh, uh, and, you know, and, and pander influence to them like the Clintons did. 
Uh, it was just giving too much money, uh, violating the uh, limits. I think instead of the $2,500 limit, he gave something like $25,000 to a, a friend of his uh, who was running for Congress, and uh, neither one of them uh, realized what the election laws were and didn't catch it in time or whatever. Fine. Fine him. Fine her. That's the way they've always handled it in the past, but they sent him to jail. That's the kind of criminal operation we have. One standard of law for everybody else and a different one for those in power. Thank you, uh, Jacob. When we come back, we can take more of your calls. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight. We're going to go back to our callers in just one moment. We've got uh, Elisha, Cash, Jesse, Debbie. We'll get to you and others uh, in just a moment. Before we do, there's something I've been wanting to talk about all day, and that is uh, an update on what happened in Nice, France. Of course, we have a uh, story from Paul Joseph Watson today at Infowars.com, which I think is very interesting. Because the French citizens, and this is a uh, local town council member, he says French citizens are, quote, getting ready for war, for a civil war. They're finally, many of them, are finally starting to understand what this open border policy is about. That is the end game. Civil war. Bringing in a massive number of people so that they can't be assimilated in time. People who don't want to be assimilated. People who are very different from those people who are there who are going to set up a, uh, a separate society there. Balkanizing the society, creating a clash of cultures, and bringing in people from areas that... Uh, the West has gone into and torn their country up in a war already. So they already come in here with a, with a problem and then bringing in mostly young men of a uh, fighting age. This is an army that's being imported in. This is an invasion. Just look at what's happening in Calais. Look at what's happened uh, in, in all of France with these different attacks. And this is an article that was uh, entitled, What Next? Could France be facing a civil war? And the author is an elected council member in the village of, I think it's pronounced Co. He asserts that the Nice truck attack has shaken France to the brink of a terrifying escalation. The good news is that the people are starting to wake up. What he said is he's warning that France may, quote, be on the edge of something resembling a civil war. Miller reveals that membership in his local gun club has quadrupled from 200 to 800 members in the last few months alone. When asked why so many French people were buying guns and becoming interested in joining the gun club, one resident told Miller they're getting ready for war. Miller explains a lot of citizens are voting for right-wing politicians because nobody aside from people like Marine Le Pen have offered anything different to President Hollande's uh, feeble response to the Charlie Hebdo, the Paris massacre, or the Nice atrocity. Look, some of them understand that this is about uh, this is designed to create a civil war. And they also understand that the government is not going to protect them. It's up to them. They're not going to get the same kind of treatment that somebody like Bono, for example, got. I was absolutely amazed to see this story on uh, the mirror via the Drudge Report. Uh, Bono was rescued by armed police after being caught up in the Nice terror attack following the ISIS lorry slaughter the truck slaughter well he wasn't really caught up this is a guy who was on the french riviera he was on the terrace of a la petite maison next to the seafront and he observed this happening to the people below him and what happened well they sent armed police to rescue him to rescue him not much help for the people on the street, okay? They, they focused, yes, they did what they could. They eventually did stop the driver after he went over a mile because only the police had guns. Nobody else could stop him. People tried. The guy tried to jump into the cab with a motorcycle. He swerved, knocked the motorcyclist over, ran over him, killed him with the uh, truck. Uh, they were basically unarmed, helpless in the face of this attack. And yet, the police send a squad of people to rescue this star. See, that's the way it's going to come down, folks. You know, if you're not uh, Bono with you two, uh, you're going to be responsible for your own safety. The police aren't going to be there to help you in a situation like this. And then Bono goes out, says, love is bigger than anything in its way. Well, not necessarily if... Somebody is coming at you with an 18-wheeler to run you down. You're not going to offer them flowers to stop them, okay? 
If you don't have a gun, if you can't get out of the way, uh, you're going to get run over and the people behind you are going to get run over and it's going to go on for minutes, minutes of running down people left and right with an 18-wheeler because nobody can stop it. And at the same time, we see these other two uh, things that were revealed in the aftermath of this attack. The fact that this guy, who many people were saying, well, uh, you know, he he uh, he ate pork and he drank alcohol and he did some of these other things. So he wasn't a Muslim. No, look, he was part of ISIS. He smuggled 84,000 pounds to his family in Tunisia days before the murdering event. Okay, 84,000 pounds. So that's what, maybe about 100 and... I don't know what the exchange rate is, maybe $130,000 or something that he sent to family. Uh, I doubt that he was making this in some kind of a delivery truck job that he was doing. Okay, This was money that was given to him by ISIS. Uh, just before the attack, he sent out a text saying, bring more weapons. It's good. I have the equipment. Okay, This was a plotted attack. There's other people involved in this. They listen to everything that we do. They destroy all of our privacy. They destroy search warrants. And yet, they can never catch these attacks before they happen. Maybe they're looking at the wrong people. Maybe they're looking at their political opponents rather than the terrorists. Meanwhile, we have Barack Obama telling us what the problem is. He's figured it out. Or in Breitbart, the headline says, Globalist Obama says that terrorist and racist cops are the chronic impulses that can only be defeated by the global elites. He says globalist elite cooperation. I guess he meant to say globalist elite corporations because they're the ones who are creating these open borders who are <laughs> destroying our society. Uh, but only the globalist elite can defeat the chronic violence caused by real jihadism in France and supposed racism in the police forces. That's what he told a room full of foreign ambassadors on July 15th. I want to play a clip of uh, how the French people who were understanding that uh, this is an engineered civil war by these same globalist elitists that he thinks are going to save us, how they reacted at a memorial service. First, they uh, cheered uh, the, uh, the French national anthem, uh, but then when the politicians responsible for this debacle came out, this is the way they reacted. <laughs> That's the very least that they deserve. It's horrific what these uh, policies are doing, and they continue to do it. Meanwhile, uh, the man who has all the answers, Imam Obama, uh, who also won a peace prize, remember, just as he took office, he was given a peace prize. Uh, he has now officially, here's the newest count. This is from ConsciousLifeNews.com. He has dropped uh, 23,144 bombs just in 2015. That's the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Imam Obama. And I think it's interesting as we look at this situation in Turkey, uh, there's a lot of back and forth. Who caused this? A uh, uh, European uh, Union official says, well, look, uh, Erdogan, Erdogan already had a list of people that he wanted to pick up. He was just waiting for the right thing to happen. Maybe it's a false flag attack. Uh, he has accused uh, Fatala Gulen, who runs this massive network of schools throughout the world, especially in the United States, gets a half a billion dollars. I talked to Mark Hall, who did a documentary about uh, the worst case example of charter schools, and that is the uh, Fatala Gulen schools that are uh, throughout the United States. Forty-five of them alone in Texas. Two hundred million dollars alone of taxpayer money going to these schools. They're being investigated multiple times by the FBI. Uh, there's uh, evidence of problems with the H-1 visa uh, issues. There's lawsuits going on against them. Whistleblowers have talked to the uh, people who have uh, uh, created this film. And this film has been shut down just like Vaxxed was shut down at the film festivals. Remember the movie uh, Vaxxed about the connection between autism and vaccines? And Robert De Niro, who's part of the Tribeca Film Festival, he has a son, or I think it's a son, I think it's... Uh, a child who has uh, autism, he believes uh, it was a result of a vaccination. Uh, he was interested in having that there, but the uh, people running the film festival talked him out of it. They shut it down, and the same thing is happening to Killing Ed. They're shutting it down out of uh, South by Southwest, and this is a story that really kind of focused on what's going on here in Texas. Again, these uh, uh, Gulen schools, there's 45 of them in Texas. There's about 150 of them in the United States. There's about 1,000 of them worldwide. Everywhere else uh, where they're operating, they're operating explicitly as Islamic madrasas. 
this guy, uh, Glenn, is an imam who was brought here, uh, helped by the CIA to get here. He's set up in Pennsylvania. Now er Erdogan is saying that he is uh, the person behind uh, the coup. He's trying to get him extradited. And it has set up a conflict now because Erdogan in Turkey... Uh, is cracking down on these people. He's arrested about 6,000 people. He's arrested people who are in the military, the police, the judiciary, the bureaucracy, the educational establishments. Uh, there is a, there's essentially these two men represent the two power bases in Turkey. They used to be allies. Both of them are Islamicists, okay? It's not there's not a good guy in, in this fight, folks. Uh, you know, we're, we always get this uh, dichotomy that is sold to us, and we always want to believe that one is good and one is bad. That's not always the case. Most of the time when the government is giving us those, uh, that, that uh, duopoly, that choice, you know, it's like Republicans and Democrats, they're both bad, okay? There's not a good option there. Uh, that's what we're seeing here with uh, this. But it is also creating uh, tension and issues with NATO, with the European Union, uh, with the United States, and with Turkey. Okay, we have a, a military base in Turkey. Uh, it has a lot of nuclear missiles on it. That base has been shut down. Erdogan is using that as a leverage point against Obama to try to extradite his political enemy, Fatalogu Gulen. Now, the United States, if that doesn't happen, what's going to happen? Is Turkey going to move towards the Russians? We had, uh, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, Mark Hall came on. He knows a great deal about Turkey. He knows about the Gulenist uh, network. And we have a couple of videos that you'll see uh, up on the uh, Alex Jones YouTube channel, uh, both about the the issues before us in terms of uh, will Turkey move towards Russia as a pivot. Uh, we know that uh, Erdogan has been channeling, he's been whitewashing uh, the uh, oil money coming out of ISIS. He's been a channel for weapons going into ISIS. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of conflict with Russia in the past, but there's also now recently been some moves towards Russia. And if he doesn't get what he wants from the United States, perhaps that's going to change the balance of power there. But of course, Erdogan, an Islamicist, has been working with ISIS along with the CIA. Meanwhile, you got another guy that's with the CIA, Fatala Gulen, who is trying to take over Turkey. I mean, it's, it's a mess. That's our foreign policy. That's our dark, secret government. We see this happening over and over again. So check out those videos. I think you'll find them uh, interesting. You'll see them on the Alex Jones channel, the interviews I had with uh, Mark Hall yesterday on the Sunday show. Let's go back to your calls. Uh, let's go to Elisha in California. Elisha, go ahead. Thank you yes, uh, in about, uh, hey. about four hours from now on PFAX, there's a talk show host to that uh, named Jesse Gastan that you might want to tune into. He's a preacher on KFAX at noon, but he takes the talk show helm on Mondays. Now, I would like to uh, ask a question in regards to uh, those uh, uh, only Black Lives Matter uh, people and George Soros. Can you give us a... Uh, an explanation or history of George Soros. Who, who is he? What's his character? What has he done in the past? And uh, I'll take my answer in the air. Well, George Soros is a uh, multi-billionaire. He made a lot of money breaking the Bank of England. He bet against them in some currency moves, and uh, he created a lot of enemies in uh, in Britain. If you, uh, his company is uh, Quantum Investing, and it's no coincidence that. Uh, uh, British intelligence put pressure on the people making the James Bond films to call their uh, villains, uh, uh, you know, the quantum of solace and that sort of thing, uh, uh, making direct analogies to George Soros. George Soros uh, initially was a Nazi collaborator, okay, during World War II. He was, he's Jewish. He was in a concentration camp. He survived by being a Nazi collaborator in the concentration camps. He freely admits that. He became a very wealthy investor. Uh, as I point out, one of the uh, things that he made his most mo uh, the most money on was uh, currency manipulations. He has a uh, Open Society Foundation. The Open Society Foundation has been funneling money to Black Lives Matter, to uh, organizations, non-government organizations uh, in um, uh, the Ukraine and other places. It's a matter of record that he has given them money to finance color revolutions which are civil wars there. You know, it's one of the ways that bankers and financiers make their money. They don't make money if markets are stable. They make money with insecurity and knowing which direction that insecurity is going to take because they cause it in many cases, all right? What he's doing here in America, if you look at Black Lives Matter more specifically, uh, you've got people like D. Ray McKesson, who is uh, living in a mansion that is uh, being given to him for free by a couple of people who are on the foundation of uh, 
uh, George Soros's Open Society Foundation. Uh, he's also collecting, I think, about one hundred sixty thousand dollars as uh, uh, on an education board in, uh, I think, it's Maryland. It's in, it's uh, in Baltimore, I believe. Uh, but again, this is where the people hang out. This is where people like Bill Ayers and others go. They go into the educational system because that's how they can manipulate society. That's the most effective tool. It's far more effective for Bill Ayers to uh, blow up our country with our educational system, indoctrinating people, than it is to try to individually blow up and kill, uh, blow up buildings and kill cops. Okay, he got a lot more done uh, pushing his educational uh, agendas. And so you've got people like uh, these people who are giving D. Ray McKesson a, a free house to live in. He's collecting $160,000 as his uh, job there on the school board. And we've had uh, exposés of people who have been given direct checks from Open Society Foundation and other Soros organ organizations to run Black Lives Matter. And it follows a pattern that we've seen throughout Eastern Europe of creating a revolution. Now, the... Revolutions that we've seen in Europe in the past have been revolutions based upon class or they've been based upon pitting one ethnic group against another. That's what we see happening in the Ukraine, uh, pitting uh, people who are Ukrainians against the Russians. Here, the obvious uh, play is to pit black people against white people. And that has been the goal of the uh, radical left uh, since the mid 60s to have a revolution that is primarily one that is a race war, not a class war, but a race war, because the classes are not that well defined in America like they are in Europe. And so they can create an ethnic war. They can import people. That's what the massive open borders are about. It's about creating other ethnic groups that can create con that can use that to create conflict. They don't just bring in people who are clients of theirs, who are going to be dependent on them, who are coming here for a free education. They truly do want to have a clash of civilizations, and uh, that's what this is fundamentally about. Uh, and that's basically, uh, I think, as far as we need to go into it. Let's give some of the other callers a chance to call in. Let's talk to uh, Cash in uh, Missouri. Go ahead, Cash. Yeah. Hello, David. Hey. How are you? Doing good. Go ahead. Good, good. Hey, uh, David, I just wanted to bring up, I, I can't believe nobody else has, maybe somebody else has, but thought of this idea. But, uh, uh, man, I'd love to have some Hillary for uh, prison bumper stickers. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, Nico, do we have that at the InfoWars store? Do we have Hillary for prison bumper stickers or we just have the uh, T-shirts? As far know? as I know, we just have the T-shirts. But Yeah, I'll right now we it. just have T-shirts. Okay. Yeah, maybe we could even come up with a banner that you could tie to your car and stream it behind like we did the airplane. I don't know. There's a lot of different ways that we could do it, but that's a, that's a great idea. Uh, do you have a Hillary for Prison t-shirt? Uh, yeah, I've got four of them uh, and uh, uh, given uh, three of them away now. There you go. And uh, I got another half a dozen ordered. People see them. They say, where can I get them? I want them. <laughs> Can you get me one? Uh, and I just been buying them and giving them to them. That's a great you design. Know. Thank you, Cash. Stay with us. We'll be right. Okay, folks. Carl Rove is on the same flight with us to Cleveland. We're here in Dallas. I'm just gonna go over and ask me a few questions. Let's go. Ahead. Once again, once again, you're distorting the facts, but I appreciate it. And what, I love and what I've told you is, I'm working for Fox. I have a. If you want me to appear on your program, you call Fox. And I, and I know you don't think the rules apply to you, and I like what you do. Call Fox. If you have to be around the phone. Well, I do have an audience almost as big as Fox. Call Fox. The one year will be better. Oh, I know. Call Fox. You're an important guy. Call Fox. I'm sure there will be. No, no. I'm having a conversation with Fox. Brad 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 Fox. Br
and like he did in 2012. And that's what he does. Here he is right here, talking to these little delegates and people. The superdelegates, they hope they can get to siphon off the votes, but he failed. So this guy's going in as a failure to leave one unable to steal the election from Trump. He wouldn't talk to him for wars that kind. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. There'll be lots of this once we're in Cleveland. We had to talk to him, obviously. And he played his whole game. I thank you. I waited five minutes when we talked to these folks. I knew as soon as he came over, he'd be like, these are my friends. You know, you're interrupting them while they try to talk to me. Well, they're just my little friends. This is the guy that supported Bush and the assault weapons man. This is the guy that pushed amnesty. This is the guy that's a global. These are the people that have hijacked the Republican Party. The, the Clintons and the Bushes vacation together. They call themselves brothers and sisters. And let's just come over. Hey, Carl, I'm going to leave you alone. I appreciate your time. Do you consider yourself a family member like the Bushes do with the Clintons? Is he a founder with the Clintons? No, 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 no. Do you consider the Clintons to be family? No. Why don't you wander off? Why don't, why don't you wander around? I am, I am. Just, are you with, are you family with the Clintons? Okay, well, Okay, and that's Alex Jones encountering the turd blossom. Uh, pure BS. That's uh, Carl Rove at the airport. I want to go to our callers. We've got just a little bit of time here. Let's go to uh, Jesse in Texas. Jesse, go ahead. Hi, David. Um, I was just wondering with the uh, shootings in Dallas and in Baton Rouge, both shooters being uh, veterans and stuff, are they going to try to push the narrative again that one of the most dangerous things is uh, returning veterans. Oh, absolutely. You know they're going to. You know they're going to uh, blame the veterans. You know they're going to blame um, uh, weapons. They've, they've come up with a number of uh, issues to say that we need to, uh, and this has been supported by the NRA and people on the right saying uh, we need to look at uh, mental health issues. You know, if you even have uh, auto pay on your account, then that's a sign of incompetency. And we need to take away your weapons. They're looking for any excuse they can to take people's guns. And I would just repeat, if you want to know how this is going to play out, look at France, where people were run down by a car for a minute and a half before any police could get to the scene. Look at Venezuela, where they hunt the police down for their weapons and kill them to get the guns. They had full gun control there in Venezuela. That's the hypocrisy that's being sold to us by the gun control left by people like Matt Damien, who makes millions of dollars playing with guns on television, says we want to confiscate them like they did in Australia. Join us tonight for the InfoWars Nightly News, 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern.